And we're live. That was weird. Yeah, we're live. <laughs> well, it told me we're recording too often. What's that? It told me we're recording too often. It tells it told you we're recording too often? Yeah. That's really odd. I think it's because maybe we both hit streaming. I don't know. Like we both turned it on. Oh, maybe. Well, I'm not turning it off. Okay. So, uh, do you have an intro? Or <laughs> oh, yeah, to the Gore Dogs Pub, where <laughs> I don't know. Oh God, yeah. So there was a. Uh, my wife was thinking about this, and a funny story about this. Oh, um, I was trying. So my friends at work were asking me about the channel. And I spelled it out for him even. And one of them was like, he thought it was Gordox, <laughs> one word. And my wife was telling me, she's like, oh, yeah, when I hear you guys say that, I hear Gordox, like, down at the Gordox, down at the Gordox, you know, instead of down in the boondocks. So that was our intro. It was amazing and beautiful. It was me singing. You don't get that very often. If you missed it, I guess you could rewind. Yeah. So what are we working on today? We're working on the same thing. We're working on this pinup. Except for uh, we're pretty much closing in on the for puns. Okay, I heard puns. That's all I heard out of it. I said we're closing in on the finishing strokes. And then I said I just left that open for puns. Okay. Well, it sounded like you were underwater up until you said puns. So. I don't, I don't know. know just, I facing, should... just facing away, maybe? I don't know. No, I don't know. Not talking like... loud enough? Roo, 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 puns. Yeah, okay. Should I plug my speaker back in and see if we get, or microphone no. back in and see if I get feedback? No, you're good. Like half the time it works. Yeah, I just, half know, I, I just don't know which half. It's it's a good mic. I just don't know why it's doing what it's doing. I don't know if it's StreamYard uh -huh. or or what. But I do new. Like I changed oh. the direction on the mic and everything else. So I've chose to do this entirely on screen for the most part. Like I just <laughs> did, I did two lines so that I can show a light source coming across behind them. Um, but I'm I'm doing most of the detail on there. We've done the drawing and done pretty much most of the shadowing on here. So I felt like it would be would have been cheating to just draw it off, you know, offline and show you, oh, this is how far I came without you looking. Just for some reason didn't feel right. So, <clears throat> but I'm not promising I'm going to stay with that paradigm. Yeah, I mean, if we had more people watching, I think that paradigm would fit, it would work, but uh, right now it's like, I just want to get product done, you know, get, get storyline finished, although I've been incredibly unproductive. Like ever since... I started this? <laughs> no, ever since I, uh, I wrote that, that novella over spring break, I'm just don't want to do anything I have been incredibly lethargic and just none of my projects seem interesting I don't know I just it's not been it's, good it's really weird like I've picked up productivity as far as writing but 
I feel like I crammed out too much too fast, and now I'm just recuperating, which is dumb. Like, there's, I, ugh. You know, that could be. Larry Korea talks about recharging your batteries quite often. Like, he'll be playing video games, and somebody will be like, you should be working on the next novel, and he's, you know, he's the type to say, fuck you, but then he's saying, <laughs> he's saying, fuck you, I'm recharging my batteries. You don't want the kind of crap that I write if I take a break, you know. But well, he's maybe that's prolific, you know. So, but normally I've got something going on. I don't know. It's almost like a constant companion. Like it's something to to always be thinking about. Like if you have a moment of downtime, oh, let's think about whatever story I'm working on, or <laughs> yeah, right. I don't have that. Sometimes I don't feel like I. Sometimes I don't feel like I've actually done anything if I haven't written. Is that weird? Yeah. Like, no, I, mean, I. Well, I'm, I'm doing this, and I still don't feel like I've done anything if I haven't gotten anything written. Yeah. <clears throat> that's uh. Yeah, that's how I feel right now, and I'm and it, it makes me very anxious, and I don't like it, and then the anxiety makes it worse. And it's, like, it's a wonderful downward spiral. I've been playing a lot more Call of Duty with my son. And that helps. Oh, hey! Aeroset! Oh, hey! She said I don't have brakes. I don't have brakes. I have burnout. Nice, yeah. Oh, I, was... you know, I, I haven't burnt out on anything except for tattooing in a long time. And I burnt out on tattooing early on. And I realized that when I burn out, it's normally because I'm, I'm trying to get a lot more done than is possible for the, for the time. She said, I have, I have go, go, go till my face is raw like I've rubbed it on sandpaper, then I let it heal and go again. <laughs> that's that's a lot. Oh. Yeah, I just Oh. I don't know what it is lately. I I have projects I can work on, projects I can finish. Pro, you know, just you know, there's this one. Well, I've written stuff for this one and we have yet to catch up. We need catch up. The whole story's not done. That's true, but we haven't gotten to the parts where I haven't figured it out yet. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's exactly where you are. <laughs> no, no, it's good. I can take my time catching up. <laughs> as long as I've got a script to go by, which I really don't have technically a script to go by yet. Okay, so explain this to me, and I'm sure you've said this before. Oh. But, so like you're doing the inside of the cowl, right? And you're shading yeah. it in. And all that's going to have to be covered up by something. Ink. <laughs> something. Yeah, ink, uh, digital paint. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, so, so why, why do it? Because I'm a control freak. <laughs> okay. All right. That's, just what, I, to make that's sure. what I actually told you last time is that I want to see what it looks like. I want to see if it's right. You know, sometimes okay. it comes together. Like when I was working on him, it just came together exactly like I wanted it, you know, within a few tweaks. This, she's the, she is the front piece. She is the. She's going to be mostly what your eyes are drawn to, even though the rule is your eyes drawn to the highest point of contrast. So I'm hoping to make enough contrast where your eyes are drawn to both, but she is in the foreground, so she's the first thing you're going to look at, right? Yeah. 
So I'm taking my time, and like I said, I wanted to make sure that the light source was hitting right. Now, you see a light streak behind there, but it's actually coming from this way. <clears throat> which is what's hitting him, which is what's hitting her. And I probably will have to make more of his leg disappear. Or maybe not. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so... Arrow said yeah. she's the product, so she's got to be super shiny. She's the what? She's the product. I don't think she's that's shiny. legal. <laughs> <laughs> not in this state. Probably not on YouTube either. Or well, Twitch. she's in Nevada. Uh, only in certain places. Okay, but if it's legal in certain places, then it's legal, right? Yeah. Not, maybe not in all of Nevada. But maybe so nowadays. I I, I so. heard that California has made it legal for underage kids to do that. Oh. Yeah, I but that's Which a is misnomer. Because it's not legal for the overage guy, it's just the underage oh, kid. No, that's so that um It's all ugly. Well, it is. It's all ugly, but a lot of that came down to um let's say you're underage and you've been trafficked and all this stuff and you go to the cops they'd arrest her um yeah right well and now if, they don't arrest if, her they arrest the guy or if, they should if, if they were if they were a prostitute then they were doing something illegal that's yeah. what you're talking about it's not just like it's not just uh <clears throat> it's not just uh traffic there are people that get into it without being trafficked. Oh, I know, but and that was that, just kind that, of the mentality of it. Right. It's just not alone. taken it's just not taken into account how many people get into it just because what they think they're gonna get out of it. Arrow said I'm talking artistic products, so we can add yes, shiny yes, color instead we, of general. We know, but you left yourself open like I left an opening earlier. <laughs> oh, right. which has an opening. <laughs> you don't want to mess around with it because it's potentially dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so did you uh, hear about the Silver Surfer casting news? I did. So I dumb. did. It's just so dumb. Well, it's you just know, dumb. Did you hear? Did you hear that it was changed from one? politically correct item to another no i did not hear about that yeah there was a person of color a guy of color <clears throat> that was recast so that uh the person that's now playing silver surfer could play silver surfer oh my goodness that's just dumb because a he's it's, gonna be or whatever whoever's gonna play it's gonna be silver I uh, don't really care about their ethnicity. Um, well, yeah, I mean, to a point, but you know, you're gonna you're gonna see eth ethnic features, which which I don't care about. So I I want to make that clear right off because, right, Silver Surfer is actually, according to Jack Kirby, supposed to be a uh, part of Galactus. So he's not even supposed to be a separate person. He's supposed to be part of Galactus. <clears throat> and you're you're right, it shouldn't matter the ethnicity at all because it's a it's a piece of something else, right? Yeah. I, That's I like just... uh like uh the scroll and all these these other uh cosmic bad guys are really green people. What does it matter what uh color actor plays them they're supposed to be green anyway yeah. <clears throat> so yeah. i i think i think that's just a bunch of political nonsense like i, I really hate it when politics invade fiction because they they change something that doesn't need to be changed oh yeah that reminds me i better put this on both about put it on what Oh, don't worry about it. Um, hmm. So, 
Also, I was thinking I have seen three movies in two days. And that to me is like a big deal because I never really have time to watch movies because I do shit like write and draw and get into internet arguments. No, really. Mostly write and draw. Here we go. <laughs> so, have, have you I've... seen. Did, did you watch Vesper? No. And I, I watched it. I, I was totally hoping it was going to be good. It had elements that I thought visually, visually, they had some really, really cool stuff. But they only used it for a few scenes. And then the rest of it was pretty much filmed in an old abandoned hillbilly's house. And it was like this. <laughs> Have you ever seen Wex? Wex? Yeah, Wex. L-E-X-X, sci-fi, oh. the sex robot, or a sex alien. No, I guess I haven't. Well, she's got this flying robot head that she talks to. Well, there's a kind of flying robot head in this, too. Huh. <clears throat> Arrow said, R.I.P. Rich, we're doing three movies in two days. And she used to let movies run all day here in the background while she worked. <laughs> also, I put a comment up, which ostensibly looks like it's from you. That says the views and comments expressed by Rich are not indicative of Brett's views. Brett sometimes is just too tired to argue on the internet. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who's uh, seen the episode is this. <laughs> yeah. Well, there um, I. Just, I was thinking about that last time because I was like, I don't know if I agree with what Rich is saying, but then I was tired. And I was like, and I don't know if I'm going to argue. <laughs> yeah, well, you here. just you should say that out loud instead of you know making it look like I said that. But well, anyway, whatever. That's like, because I can't type. If I type a comment, it's going to be from you. From the StreamYard thing? So... It doesn't come up from me. Even though I'm logged in as me. Did you type it on... I typed YouTube it on StreamYard. Or, uh, I put it in the comments. No, did you type from your account into one of the... Like, YouTube or Twitter? Or not no, Twitter. Uh, I just Twitch? put it on StreamYard. That way, it right? Hits. But that's why, because you're typing from Streamyard, and that's going to be me. Well, if you're typing into Twitch in your account, then it'll be you. That's why I wrote everything in, in third person. <laughs> yeah, but I wouldn't say that shit. Yeah, Arrow, I I just about was falling asleep last time. I mean, it was late, so. As much as I enjoy it, uh, as a teacher, I tend to get up kind of early. So, I'm not as young as I once was. Six hours That's of sleep. I'm coming. Yeah, I always think, like, when my students were like, you know, it was up till 3 a.m. partying or playing video games, and I'm like, why? That's a great time to be asleep. <laughs> yeah, except for... Arrow, I teach English high school. Or, I teach English in high school, I guess. <laughs> so, I watched Vespa. I mean, wasn't super impressed. I, there was a really a couple of really good images. It did have potential. Yeah. Which is why I watched it. But it turned into uh, 
a climate climate movie basically. Wow. And that wasn't what yeah. I was signing on to see. Yeah. Arrow said it's ten and thirty AM there. And to get the coffee IV hooked up and that getting older equals no I'm not staying up, I'm sleeping because it's my right and I'm an adult. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I don't do that. I, well, I do. I wish I, I could, really. I don't, man, for me to take a nap, I have to be deathly ill. Oh, no. Like, oh. I'm, I, I just can't express <laughs> how hard it is for me to take a nap unless I'm so sick that I really can't can't focus, can't stay up. All I need is my dog laying well, next I mean, it's better if it's my wife with me, but I can make do with the dog being a nice, hefty lover. Now lump. who's talking dirty shit? Uh, what are you now? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Where'd they make that legal? Is that Greece or Spain or I some don't European know. nation? Welcome to the Gordox pub where the women are gone and the dogs are scared. Oh. Only in that part of the pub. Arrow <laughs> <laughs> said she lives on naps. I'm a bi nocturnal sleeper, so I sleep five hours a night and three in the day. Yeah, I think I might be like that too. Like during I the summer I when I have off. Really do. Oh, I wish God. I could have just came. I could stay up late and then sleep. Yeah, like five hours, and then get up and, and do work or whatever, and then, yeah, take another three-hour nap at night or in the afternoon, and then stay up late, and then do it all over again. I I can thrive on that, but my wife hates it. I mean, she really gets upset with me when I do that kind of stuff. So, well, my wife can sleep a lot, too, but I can't. I just can't. Well, that's why my wife gets yeah. upset, because she wants me to go to bed when she goes to bed. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't have that issue, but my mind doesn't shut off. I just can't shut it off and go to sleep. If I lay down and I'm not asleep within a couple of minutes and I'm thinking about something. Yeah. Unfortunately, and it just doesn't fucking shut off. <laughs> I guess that's really kind of why I write, because I can't shut my brain off, so. A lot Arrow, of times at I night. Envious. Arrow said oh, that she's both a late night. night. Arrow said she's a late night and early morning person, so normally she sleeps between 4 to 9 a.m. and then again at 2 to 5 p.m. And there was an amazing book she read that went through all the daily routines of famous people and the amount of creatives who had broken up sleep habits. I could see that. Because if you're up late at night, you can do work when everyone else is, like, is it going to interrupt you? I exactly have that issue. Like, I, that's why we started streaming, or I started streaming this time, because... Eli goes to bed around this time, so I don't have to worry about him interrupting. And usually, no matter what I'm doing, if Eli wants my attention, he gets it. I just, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll just tell him just a second so I can finish, you know, this sentence or whatever, and then he gets my attention for the extent. And uh, when he, you know, at, after eight, generally he's trying to get to bed because he wants to get up for school the next day, so. That's the perfect time to stream because I don't have to worry about him needing my attention. Then I get told, you should stream earlier. Like, yeah, it wouldn't work if I streamed earlier. Yeah, Arrow, I agree. The late night uh, creative spark, I always, that's the thing that always annoys the crap out of me because, like, I know when my availability is 
And so like Saturdays tend to be good days to work, but I'll fight all day long and then it'll get pretty late at night. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, oh, that's a great idea and start working. But I get frustrated all day. Ugh. Uh, Kevin J. Anderson gave me a piece of advice that I use, and yeah. it helps. It's it's not perfect, and it's not perfect all the time, but it definitely helps me be productive is that if you can't write, just write one sentence. Like, it's almost always if you write one sentence, your mind will click in for the next sentence. And then you may just write a couple of paragraphs or whatever, but it's a couple of paragraphs more than what you had. Yeah, and that's probably good advice, too. I could see that working. Well, he's very prolific. The trick is that he also dictates. So, you know, he's, I know. he's talking into a <laughs> he's talking into a recorder, so he doesn't have to stare at the blank page and all that. He does have someone that transcribes for him, but... Also, you know, I, I know that he does like edits and kind of rewrite sections here and there. And transcribers don't get everything right, you know. So. It's one of those pieces of advice that I took from him that I think is really sound. And another one is uh, writers write. We don't, we're not married to one project. We don't just write one thing. Right. So, like, if you write something and you submit it, you don't wait for it to either be accepted or denied. You write the next thing because writers write. And if you're not writing, you're not a writer. Yeah. Arrow said, you got to be a good uh, uh, dad and husband. Putting sleep ahead of that. Today's world is unrealistic. But <clears> she's <throat> there. It's just her and her dog, so she has that freedom. You know, I would love to think that I'm a good dad and husband, but I think that I'm never going to be as good as I could be or should be. That's, uh, I guess because I really care about it. And I've definitely not been as good of a dad <laughs> at times as I should have been, you know. Well, it's like I was, you know, like, I'll often think, you know, compare how I'm doing to how my father was and at whatever age and the boys and whatnot. There are some things I think I've done better than my dad, and then there are other things that I'm like, that man had it on lock, and I don't. So, you know, it's one of those things you <laughs> keep trying. I couldn't do that because I didn't have an example. Mine died when I was 14 months old. Oh. And I either learned to be a man by myself or from people who taught me the wrong ways. You know? I had a couple of stepdads, but... One was really super brilliant, but didn't have didn't have any persona, didn't have any ability to, you know, be with a kid and help raise a kid and give him fatherly advice because he was awkward in his own right. But he was a genius, you know, like he was really, really a genius. And the other one was a piece of shit that I oh. threw out a oh. second story uh, apartment window. Oh. How'd that go? Well, you, are you asking what happened? or Because <laughs> it went well, well I'm, I'm, for me. It went well for me. It didn't go so well for him because, you know, he went down two flights of stairs onto some big air conditioners naked. Huh. Arrow, I don't think Rich had a couple of stepdads like at the same time. 
No. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I caught how he phrased I'd it. Yeah, hell of a lot. I'd be a hell of a lot worse of a person. Yeah. <laughs> Personally, if that was the, if that was the case. <laughs> yeah. Oh, goodness. That's one of those things where, yeah, I caught it, but I was like, no, nah, I'll let that one go. I'll let that one go. <laughs> What's that? Oh, just when you said you had a couple of stepdads, just, you know, it's slow hanging fruit. Sometimes you, you don't have to pick all the low hanging fruit. Uh, well, I have two stepdads. How would you phrase it? And that's perfectly fine. I have no problem with the way you phrased it. I got two times of the car loving stepdad. I'll swap them for a dinner making stepdad. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Whew. So we were uh, we went to the store today to pick up. Uh, we normally buy these ropes for my dog to play with until she tears them apart. Right. And uh, you know she's she's down to just pieces again. So we went and bought this. And while we're there, my wife was like, "Well, let's pick up." And she picked up two more things to, for the dog to play with. And I'm like, oh, oh, I'm the one that spoils the dog, but whatever. <laughs> and uh, then she starts pulling out some of these toys. She's like, seriously, how is this not a sex toy? And then, while my son is there, which granted he's 15, so it's not terrible, but oh, she's that's, like, that's just remember, fun. anything's a sex toy if you have enough lube. And I'm just like, oh my god. So... Or are brave enough. I guess. That, that's the saying that goes around here. <laughs> yeah, Arrow, I'm, I'm sure that, yeah, you're fine. <laughs> Arrow said that uh, today's day and age is normal. I hope you don't think I'm making fun. I have a stepdad, too, and he's awesome. I just think the way you said it was hilarious. Yeah. No one's upset here. I no longer have any stepdads. Yeah. First of all, my mom's dead, and second of all, she divorced them both. Huh. <laughs> uh, my son ain't right either. <laughs> blissfully ignorant so arrow said it's time for me to check all the holes in my house and i said no <laughs> i shall not are you filming anything what? is important if you're brave enough oh no uh -uh. <laughs> see how twisty this can be oh trust me i know yeah, I wasn't just talking to you. <laughs> I was saying, you know, it could turn around on you, too. It could turn around on anybody. So, the first movie I watched was Vesper. Yeah. The second movie I watched was uh, Philip Marlowe. Have you what? seen that one? No. I even Philip Marble? Marlowe. Philip no. Marlowe. It's actually an old 50s, you know, it's like the Maltese Falcon guy and oh, well. Chinatown. But yeah, Philip Marlowe. There's a new movie with Liam Neeson playing Philip Marlowe. Oh. And uh, 
I read the reviews and they were all like, oh, it's miserably slow and all this other shit. And I watched it and I was like, it's not any slower than any noir film. And it's basically noir detective fiction. So what were you expecting when you watched a noir movie? If you were expecting speed, you know, quick stuff happening, then you're, you know, you're in the wrong genre. For the 563rd time, Arrow watched Inception yesterday. Oh, so I'm guessing you like that movie. Uh, or you she, just she, like she, to she, look at Leonardo she, Da Vinci <laughs> DiCaprio. I haven't watched much, I mean, yeah, I haven't watched much of anything. Yeah, I normally don't. I kind of surprised myself by watching as much as I watch. And I think I was wrong about that being the number two movie. That was the last one. I started to watch uh, a movie with Denzel Washington and Ryan Reynolds. Safer? No. Yes. Safe uh, house. No. What is that? I've. I think I know what you're talking about. I just can't think of it. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, oh, it was safe house. I was right. Good. Yeah. I love being right. Ah. Uh, believe I've seen that. I started to watch it. I didn't, you know, I was looking around and realizing that there's a lot of movies that I I missed, like, especially in the 80s, because I'm like, Andy Garcia was in another mob movie that I haven't seen, and I'm like, really? <laughs> I'm going to have to watch that. I was thinking it was kind of funny the other day I saw a picture for the poster for the original Flatliners. And I'm like, oh, yeah. that cast is way too expensive now. Like, you could never and, put those people in a movie. And at least one of them probably will shoot other cast members. Did you hear about that, uh, the proxy fight with uh, Disney and Bob Iger and I forget the other guy's name, Peltz, I think his name was, trying to get people on the board? And, and he was, I think it was Peltz, I think that's his name. I could look it up if I really cared. But he was saying that, uh, you know, he was, like, there are quotes of him, like, why do I need to have an all-female Marvel's? You know, why did an all black cat is like, why can't we just have superheroes and, you know, and basically not be quite so woke and just provide entertainment? You know, the things that people used to go to movies for and things like that. And, uh, Pelt's lost his bid. I think, I think his group spent about 25 million trying to get some people on the board. And I guess Disney spent like forty million, but uh, 
it's you know and bob Iger swore he's like no we're we're gonna focus on story we're gonna leave the politics out of it supposedly um well we know better than that well and then some of this stuff drops you know and i'm like on one hand i'm like this has been in the works for a while like you don't just turn on a dime and you have a corporation that large so like when they released uh, uh, Tales of the Empire, they, they released the trailer for that, and it's it's about two girls, um, and then of course, oh, what was the the Star Wars Acolyte? That's obviously heavily female oriented, or female led at least. Um, and then they do the Silver Surfer as a girl. You know, it's it's the same stuff that they've been doing. Um, demasculate, emasculating. That's the word. Emasculating um, Star Wars. Emasculating Marvel. Um, and that's that's going to happen for a while. Like you can't. Is the Disney board? The board of directors. Um, so you're gonna. I mean, we're still gonna get some of this stuff for a while. Like you can't just all of a sudden decide, yeah, we're gonna focus more on story than than politics, and then have it. You know, like you're gonna have a delay for of at least I would guess a year or two, the bare minimum, before we start seeing any real changes. And. I don't know if they'll... Uh, some of this stuff, it's like, I, I really think you're just trying to alienate your your audience. I agree, Arrow. I'd love if they just made new characters or, I don't know, just... Uh, yeah. New characters would be good. You know, really, like we've said it so many times, it, it's not what the orientation or the ethnicity or whatever of the characters is it's right. a changing of changing of the stats and changing of how it really is to try to show some world that doesn't exist well like, i mean technically they, star wars is making new characters but when they're all women it just seems like okay, I get it. You... Well, I'm just saying, like you know, you're you're trying to have an equivalency of representation that doesn't exist, right? And that's that's the key thing is that you're alienating a lot of people because they know it doesn't exist and they don't want it to just exist on film or whatever, you know. Well, that's like. <laughs> A friend of mine really wanted, he he really advocated for making a female James Bond. And I just was like, that's just called a bait and switch. Well, that's what pisses people off. It's like, that's not James Bond. Right. And, well, James Bond is literally his real name is James Bond. We've, we've discussed this, but there are plenty of other agents that are female agents. Yeah. Why not take one of them? There are black yeah. female agents. There are. Asian female agents, they're other female agents, so why not just load that up with that? I, I don't, that's yeah, what I it, don't get, it's, except for they just want to destroy something that's there. Well, that's the other it's thing, like, though. It's like, I want to see an agent that's different. I don't want you just to make a female James Bond. I want an agent that's fully developed on her own. She shouldn't do it the way James Bond does. And I'm not saying that, oh, she's going to be bigger, badder, you know, she can kill 75 guys with her pinky. You know, it's like unrealistic stuff like that. I want to see someone... Yeah, that's not like, a strong woman character, really. People mis misinterpret what strong women characters are. I agree. Like, let me see a actual, real, strong female character as a spy. That's what I was upset with. Well, that's one of the things I was upset with. Yeah, you know what that when would it was, be? Uh, that would be... Mata Hari. 
Okay. Because she was a real spy and a real female character that had real female relationships and all that. Which is well, what just... they mean by a strong female character is... Uh, Instead, they give you a female without a penis, or a male without a penis, basically. Well, that's not what they mean. They mean, they're supposed to mean, that's what they claim that they mean, is that they want to see female relationships that aren't based on guys or based on being the uh, love interest of, you know what I mean, the yeah. the male star. And what people have conflated it as is uh, Ronda Rousey or something like that. And that doesn't always have to be true. Right. I mean, not that you can't have characters like uh, Gina Carano in, in, in Haywire was pretty good. That was kind of a Jason Bourne type female character, though. It wasn't so super had, unrealistic. Uh, what was her name? Uh, now I can't think of her name. Nor can I think of her. Charlie Stara did one, and I can't remember what it was called. Oh, uh, but you know, it's like okay, she's a female spy, and all right. I mean, it was I a little unrealistic. A them, and yeah, right. But that's the thing is that if you really are writing a strong female character, females have skills and abilities that men generally don't. And using those skills and abilities makes something original, not just switching out, you know, a, a guy for a woman. That's why I did not like Ocean. Well, that's one of the two reasons why I did not like Ocean's 8. Because, you know me, I, I'm a big fan of heist films. I, I think the... Ocean's Eleven, I thought was great. Ocean's Twelve, I enjoyed, although a lot of people don't. I think it's fun. Now Ocean's Three isn't as good, or Ocean's Thirteen isn't as good. But it's not terrible. It's just kind of re it's kind of a rehash of the first one, so that's why I don't like it as much. But Ocean's Eight, a it lies to the audience, and that pisses me off. Um, and B it. It's just, sure, they're women, if you say so. But overall, it's basically just, it's still just God. I mean, it's just, I don't know. Hey, Jay. Jay says, hey, peeps, or e peeps. Hey. I had high hopes for Ocean's 8, and it just... That's another problem. You know, when you have high hopes for a property and then it... <laughs> yeah. they ruin That's the it. problem, is that you're getting high hopes for a property. I know. <clears throat> Especially these days. Just let it go. Let it go. Ocean's 8 could have been so much better than what it was. And that's the part that bothers me. And that's the part, though, also where I'm like, no, I'm okay with a an all-female heist film. Sign me up. Just make it actual women. Not just right. guys that don't have a penis. <laughs> and you're not specifically talking about trans people here. No, I'm not. I... Well, that's just saying for clarification. Uh, okay. I think that's, I don't know. I mean, like, part of that, you have, when you start talking about some of these issues, and you're like, you have to go pretty far left 
to say some I mean, like, like some of the stuff that they want you to espouse you know even five years ago would uh, no and uh, it's no matter how far left you go it's going to be it won't be enough later on like it's just it's not a winning game you just can't do it yeah, yeah. so you kind of just might as well take the loss now and deal with it I don't know On this episode of Brett Blowing His Nose, ah, my wife was cleaning. My son decided he wanted to clean his room. He had a window. (laughs) Yeah. This is fiction right now, isn't it? No, he was like, I want to clean my room. All right. (laughs) And he wanted his his mom's help, which I'm like, okay, cool. You chose the right parent because I'm not the right one. Not for that job. But they sat there and you know, and they they did a great job cleaning up his room, fantastic. But like, they had the window open and a fan in it because they were getting hot. I had been cold all day, and now I got the sniffles, and I'm like, yeah, you guys made me sick. I am not happy. But at least this room's clean. Yeah, I'm I'm still dubious on believing this story. I'm, uh, <laughs> How old is he to volunteer to clean his room? Fifteen. Yeah, see, that that makes me dubious. <laughs> That's enough well, he, to make it hard to swallow. He had a, a glass top drafting desk, and he wants to get rid of it. So part of the cleaning was to make so he could get it out. Um, you know, just stuff like that. So. It's fine, but like I said, they probably just kicked up dust and whatnot, and I'm just going to be sniffling for three or four days now, but oh well. Oh, I got to eat this one because it's going to be loud. What's that? What? I said I had to mute that. It was going to get loud. Oh, honker. That's right. Ah. Nobody needs to hear that trumpet blow. Let me tell you. So I'm seeing uh, a lot of A-listers. Okay. Um, turning their backs on the current political regime. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, no, and I'm talking about a lot of them that swore they would never and all this other stuff. Now. They are doing exactly what they said they would never do. Well, they also always say, you know, if Trump wins, I'm leaving the country. Or, you know, there are other people that said the same thing about Biden, I'm sure. Oh, I'm... Yeah. And, it's and so no, one's, no one's so, left the country that I've seen, so... Although I think P. Diddy did. P. Diddy has finally left. <laughs> By force, right? <laughs> yeah. Left, fled, whatever. So. I don't even know the story. I just know that there's a lot of jokes about his incarceration. Yeah, there's. I really don't know the whole story either. You know, part of me just really doesn't care. But on one hand, like people are making him out to be like another Jeffrey Epstein. And I'm like, okay, uh, weird. And then the next question out of my mind is, if he's if he was like Jeffrey Epstein or Epstein or whatever it was, uh, 
why are they going after him, but they never went after Jeffrey Epstein, really. Or they did it for a very long time. Mm. So it's a very strange scenario. Uh. I don't know. He pretty much screwed up his credibility a long time ago. So, P. Diddy is the perfect name for a nonce. Uh. A what? A nonce. What it says. Oh, you got blurry. Okay, you're better. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, just for a second, you were. What? You were blurry for just a little bit. I was blurry? Oh, yeah. Are you drinking? No. I am. <laughs> I'd get thirsty if I didn't. Well, yeah. I mean, I always have my... Diet Dr. Pepper. Not a sponsor, but it could be. And my students are always amazed because I'm always drinking a Diet Dr. Pepper. Not a sponsor. <laughs> but it could be. Those things are good. I like them. And they're sugar free. Yeah. I like them more because they're sugar free. See, you were asking earlier why I did all of this penciling. Yeah. And because I do some tight penciling. Well, can you see what I'm doing right now? Can you see what it's actually doing? Well, let me hold on a second because the better screen is small. Let me make it big. It'll make me look stupid, but. Yeah, no, I really can't. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to come in with the camera. All right. Okay, so you're making the background, the water streaks off of the... I'm the... making cracks in the stone and steel and scratches. Okay. See? But All that right. occurred because I've already laid out where the darks are, but I'm not doing strictly dark until I you know, come back through. Yeah. I've got to be careful about how much, how busy that I make this, because the busier you make it, the more that you lose the contrast and you lose the effect. Okay. But I want to have, like, debris and cracks and, you know, show that it's been weathered over time and there's a couple of bullet holes in there. Oh, that's interesting. Whoa. What was up with that? Yeah, for a minute it was my big giant ugly mug. Oh, now it is King! Yeah, what's going on with it? I can imagine the actual camera is unplugged. Oh. Okay. There's no point. There's, there is at no point is there actual any anything unplugged that goes into the camera. There's only two ends: one that goes into the camera and one that goes into the data port. And the, well, the one just... that was in the data port never moved, so it's the one I always use. Disappeared. Then I thought it was my fault. 
the one that's on top of the camera. <clears throat> yeah. When I, I get, you know, I can see when I pulled it back up that. <clears throat> that it might have jiggled something because I ended up having to glue the camera onto the stand because <laughs> for such a good for such a good camera it has a very very weak uh, mounting screw mounting screw okay. or mounting screw hole whatever you want to call it. Yeah, so this is just the fine details. Like what I put in on the overall, like I put in all of this stuff. Now I'm just putting in the small stuff that gives it the character. There's, I don't know if you can, how well you can see, because like I said, I, when I look over the screen, it's really small. But I've got cracks and bullet holes and stuff kind of running rampant through it. I want to make the wall look look weathered and have pieces that um, run into the shadows. And a lot of this is very easily created by just coloring darker spots, but I have to have the shadows laid out before I can go through all this. When I did my Jim Lee tribute picture yeah. of Prophet, I did this kind of texturing in the shadows too. Yeah. But I, but I did it all with marker, and I didn't really worry about putting it all on screen because it was me and Yev Yev Gavin, remember, and Yev uh, did his. He yeah, did everything pre-planned, and then he just when he was done, he was done. And, and it was gone, so I was like, well, I'll just finish it up and show everybody next time. So. Yeah, from what I've seen of Yev's stuff, yeah, he normally has a good chunk of it done. Or, you know, well, have the drawing done. On his own just... stream, he'll, he'll pencil one time and then he'll uh, ink wash and ink and he uses a brush to do a lot of that, so he'll literally ink wash. Um, I don't really do that. Not that I have anything against it, it's just... I'm, I'm just really trying to get a black and white look, a specific black and white look. If I was going to paint it, I'd just paint it. <laughs> an hour after uh, after we started my watch just notified me that you started a live stream on Twitch <laughs> well yeah it well, wasn't was, important anyway well I'm glad I wasn't waiting on a notification That's just 
the notifications on my watch, I swear, they're, they always seem kind of old. I don't know. Or like I won't get anything and then all of a sudden my, my wrist will just be vibrating like crazy because I'll get like 14 different notifications all at once. It's like, oh. It's good to know that that was timely. I really should be just doing this in black. <laughs> Just texturing the stuff that's in the light. Now I'll come back in with black and doodle. So speaking about you don't have a script. <laughs> uh, I mean, you have something of a script. It's just not exactly, but whatever. I mean, we're all good. But uh, I was thinking that because again, I, like some of the stuff that you said was like, no, this. Because I don't know how to pace it very well, I guess. I mean, I, I call it pacing, but I'm not even sure if that's the right word. Um, I don't know how much how much to put to the script other than, and I know there's more than one way. I should probably get a complete thought out, and then maybe we can talk. All right, let's start over. <laughs> Okay, so I was thinking, make an outline of the story, so you know yep, where things are that's going. That's a good idea. And With then, comics, usually that's called plotting. Well, I mean, if you want to get technical, whatever. <laughs> no, I mean that's generally that's generally what you're doing in the comic book. You're plotting it, and that's usually basically that saying what's going to go on in that story, which is an outline, right? We call well, it now when we write prose, but it's a it's a plot when we're writing the, the comic book. Okay, sure. It's the same thing both ways, but um, okay. <laughs> once we have an outline or a plot, I guess um, there are. I. I'm not as uh, I don't well I don't think I am at least I don't I'm not Alan Moore I'm not going to dictate you know that you need to have well, that's this good. image and like I don't <laughs> I don't because that wouldn't work well with Alan Moore uh, yeah right now. um well you you might work well but you would have nope. to. <laughs> it wouldn't work well with Alan Moore. I'm telling you right now. Okay. Well, I I don't don't work well without any freedom to interpret whatever you know okay. parts that I feel like I need to interpret. Um. So, which doesn't mean all of them, but you know, he yeah. doesn't let you interpret anything. He wants you to do exactly what he wants you to do. I I would say I am the exact other end of the spectrum. I don't care. I mean, I do, I guess. I care about the story. But, like, what goes into what panels? I'm, I, if I have a really cool idea, I'll let you know. But I kind of feel like that's more... You're the one that has to draw it, not me. So, you know, I don't know. Okay. If, if that makes sense. So in the end, it would it'd be more like we do an outline, we look over it, and then we might uh, take sections of it and then flesh that out into a better script. But even that's going to be somewhat open for 
but that's kind of my view on it. Right. Well, I just want to make sure that's going to work. <laughs> uh, you know what's going to happen in the story? I think. <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> know what's going to happen in the story. I, I have some general character arcs, um, plot lines, um, but there are still places in it where, uh, and then a miracle happens and this, you know, so I haven't quite fleshed out everything, but knowing kind of how I wanted to end, or at least a stopping point, I guess. Okay, so uh, when I say, do you know the story? That's it. You know where the story begins, where the story ends. And, you know, the general of what happens in the story. Yeah. I, so, if you're worried about uh, scripting the dialogue or whatever, you can wait until I draw something and script the dialogue to what I draw. Okay. But I kind of got to know what direction to head in if I'm going to draw it. Like, I only need to know, I guess, enough to get images on what I want to do. And I was talking to somebody that I was working with on Alpha, and he said that he didn't like, he didn't like three to five panel pages, especially in the beginning of a book. And uh, I'm kind of the opposite. I don't know of any beginnings of comics that stick to my brain that have more than five panels in the fucking first page or two. It's all about introducing, you know, they, they introduce the location, and they introduce the... Uh, basic situation and the characters. And then it explodes from there if it's going to, but... So my thinking is, is that the, the panel, the amount of panels is important. I, I don't think that it's, I know there's a lot of guys that like nine panel pages and there's a lot of guys that like six panel pages or whatever, but I like the image to tell the story, right? So okay. sometimes there might be a need to do a nine panel page, but for the most part, the things that I see nine panel pages of, they literally are drawing pretty much the same panel or they're, they're, they're drawing a character picture and then they're repeating it for a certain amount of panels like newscasters or whatever. I don't want any of that stuff in my story. It slows them down. You know what I mean? Okay. Do you want a bunch of newscasters or whatever? If, if you want no. some, one, one, one panel with a newscaster and then maybe a caption box telling the rest of the story or whatever, that's one thing. If you're saying it's on all the news networks, just say it's on all the fucking news networks. Because I don't want to see it. It's boring. It's like it's like the whole. Uh, uh, Elmore Leonard advice on writing. Leave the boring parts out. So, you know, oh yeah, if, if, that's if easy. It's gonna, if it's going to be hard to read and you're just going to stick on there looking at the same panels and they're boring panels, they're static panels. I don't want them. I don't want them. They don't do me any good. They're they're not interesting to me. 
And as an artist, if I don't have any interest in drawing it, <laughs> what's that tell you, right? Right. <clears throat> and if, if I don't have any interest in, you know, seeing this stuff, how do I expect an audience to have any interest in it? Okay. So I don't. So you don't have to worry about that shit. But if you. If you, uh, have a specific piece of information that needs to be laid in a kind of stagnant way, if, and it's one piece of information, that's one thing. But nobody wants to go on for pages and pages of exposition when nothing happens. I agree. And that's... That's the thing. It's uh, comic book writing, comic book, comic book stories are a lot like short stories in that you can skip around to the next part that's necessary. You know, it doesn't have to be all linear, or you know, it, it could could leap forward in time or whatever. There's no there's no rules against that. I'm, I'm interested in seeing something other than just the basic. I know you've got a whole bunch of ideas. We've talked, and I, and I know some of the stuff that you want to explore. But I would like to see some of the actual story progression in that. You know what I mean? Like, if, if you know something that you want to do in the story progression, I would... I'd love to see what you're thinking, and then maybe make a page off of it. And this one's supposed to be like a, a convoy kind of thing, but to me it's it's more of a way station type of thing because <clears throat> how are you going to get into a convoy? And how are you going to know where exactly your target is? And you know, so it just naturally said to me you need to get a model out of the vehicle and to. Maybe uh, go where the deal is going down, right? Okay. But you know, you haven't said anything. That's why I asked you. Like, does this, you know, does this give you any ideas? Does it inspire you at all? Because if you tell me, then I can, you know, maybe progress from there. Well, I mean, there are two things. Okay, so... Uh, there are two sections that I've written. Out, more or less. Um, the first one was the the deal that goes down. Model... At the time, it was Mr. Model. Um, you know, that, that model came up and delivers the arm and leaves and then after the bottle was gone then our guy steps in and steals it back <clears throat> and that was kind of uh, a relatively brief thing um, well it was kind of prolonging something that we could have done directly like him getting it from model right that's that's where we went with it That's kind of where we're at right now. <laughs> this this uh, splash page pinup, whatever, <clears throat> is essentially that. Okay, so that's that's what I thought. 
But that's the getting her out of the vehicle to do it thing, because the more I thought about it, the harder it would be to to make sense of a big panel inside a vehicle or how he gets in the vehicle, how he would have to he would have to learn where they're moving, right? That's what I'm thinking. He would how how did he get the information? But more than that, like I would think that the information would be Uh, more of like where I mean it was going down instead of which vehicle, which, you know, whatever. You have to know that somebody was delivering it, but if, if Model's a blood runner and he knows to look for a blood runner, and he knows the location of the deal. Model's not a blood runner. Model doesn't have a body. Therefore, we're going back and forth on that. Like, <laughs> well, again, if her body is is basically all gone, she okay. So, have... like, we have we have a misconception here because I didn't think that the person whose arm she had was the blood runner. That's... I thought I thought that the person that was transferring the message was transferring the part that held the message. Now. So the like blood runner specific. would be the person that's delivering the win or the person. That's that's why model has the arm is to keep. So, everything that was in this that I had written was that uh, they model has to keep the arm at least somewhat living. Um, and if you don't know. Um, exactly how to extract the information. You're going to use up a lot of blood, which is why she took the whole arm. Um, so it doesn't degrade the, the message, and it doesn't... Um, you have you have enough blood to um, try multiple ways of getting the information out. Um, of decoding the, the transmission. That was why she took the. That's why she takes the entire arm. Um, okay, so what the hell is she then? Well, again, I was saying she was more of a smuggler type. Um, I mean, her whole body is designed to be like that. Uh, looks like she's carrying nothing. And look, oh hey, maybe she is. Um, so. That was kind of where I was with with model. Um, so she's that a way blood the uh, Huh? So she's a blood smuggler. Okay. I I would say she can smuggle all kinds of things. So that's kind of her thing. And then for some reason, I mean, I kind of. I kind of put her as more of a free agent. If it, if I were a, if this were a D and D campaign, her her alignment would be probably chaotic neutral, and uh, I think. During the book, she'll be primarily working for the antagonists, but she's she's definitely more of a free agent in my mind. Um, so that's kind of how that works for me, for her. So like when you were talking about the caravan, for me it was like, well, you know, you, I don't. The, the thing I wrote for that, the caravan's basically destroyed on the opening scene. She walks up, and then you get to see her take the arm, and that was the kind of the the uh, the part that the hook, I guess. <laughs> um, or the graphic hook, I guess. And then we find out more, and uh, the story begins, but.
But, I mean, again, uh, no, that's funny. I've been cold all day, and now I'm hot. Uh, anyway, uh, I probably have enough now where I can do an okay outline. <laughs> it's not going to have everything flushed out, but it'll have the major parts, I think. And nothing set in stone. I don't mind changing things up if we need to change things up or if we see an opportunity later on or something you draw because I was like, oh, hey, that's just, let me work that in better. You know, like that's, that's part of the process in my opinion. So, um, so I guess we'll just have to see. It always makes me laugh when the girl on your arm jiggles. You know how she dances? Yeah. <laughs> always makes me chuckle. She's actually a vampire, but... Okay. Well, whatever. She's made me dance. That was, a, that was the point when I shaved tattooing, she dances. So you offer... Not even just artwork. It's artwork and a show. Well, I guess. <laughs> yeah. As far as like tattooing goes, I always kind of use the body part. Yeah. So I, I want to use the body part to the best effect. So it's not just a tattoo. It's a tattoo that works with the body part, whether it's like a face that gets angrier if you flex or turn, you know, a skull that gets more demonic looking, you know, if you bend your arm a certain way or whatever. But I always kind of planned for that body part. Like, trying not my to waste was, space. My son was talking about you know who Kirby is, the Nintendo character? Yes. So he was like, I should get Kirby put on my bicep. So when I flex, he, he gets bigger. I was like, okay, sure. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> he has to have some muscle first. It doesn't quite work that way, though. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't really quite work that way either. I mean, yeah. you have to... The, the trick with that kind of thing is he's a round character. Yeah. So you have to plant him on... Either you have to put the pattern on with him flexing, or it's going to distort when he flexes. Oh, yeah? And that's part of the, the key to the things that I did with muscles is you know you know the areas you got and after after a while you get to know how they work with a tattoo. So you can kind of predict a little bit. You can also, to the other way, you can kind of predict what's going to go wrong so it's not going to work the way you think or whatever.
Okay, since last time I was too tired to argue. <laughs> this time I'm I'm more awake. And we're not necessarily arguing. I'm just okay because I don't feel like arguing. <laughs> <laughs> We're putting forth a, a different opinion about uh, the hero's journey because you said it's something that you apply to something after it, but uh, I didn't say apply. I said that's that's what he did. Okay. He compiled that stuff after stuff was written. I say you don't use it as a roadmap. Well, and all of some, like you can thing. obviously, but. Yeah. It's, okay. Then it becomes formulaic, and okay. I, I doesn't, I don't think it's good. It, it becomes formulaic. Well, that's a little bit different. I mean, because last you're like, that's something. It's, it's not exactly what you said last time. Well, okay, I said so I, I don't like it. That's fine. And I said that it's used to put things in a box that don't necessarily belong in the box. <clears throat> okay. And, and I, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm, it was this last time you're like, you can't really make it a outline, and I'm like, yeah, you can. And you just well, said, yeah, you can make anything an outline, but you can tell it, it's bad. <laughs> you can do it, but it's bad, and it's obvious, and you know what's going to happen. So, okay. You want to do it, that's fine. I don't but again, it. with I don't the, like it. You know, that's a personal opinion. But I don't think you have to use it. Is what what I really was getting at is that there are, there's more than one way to outline. There's more than one way to plan a story. There's more than one way to tell a story. And Joseph Campbell didn't tell a story. He never used that to tell a story. He broke it down. I actually did say last time that George Lucas used that. As the framework for Star Wars. Yep. So I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying it's 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 all too often used as a recipe for fiction. Yeah. <clears throat> That's kind of the problem with Save the Cat. All those yeah, things. yeah. I, no, absolutely. I don't disagree with that at all. Save the Cat is another another formulaic style. Yeah. Uh, James, James Scott Bell, who I, I really like the way he put it, is basically kind of a little bit of a combination of them. But he's literally using other people's stuff and his own stuff. So he's not like saying, well... This is my theory. He's saying this is how it's worked for me, <clears throat> and, and and that's just plot and structure. And what he's talking about is that it's it's structure. It's not not necessarily a like it, it doesn't have to be exactly this way. It's a structure. It's it's like a when you're making a sculpture and you're using clay you use like a, a framework that's a loose framework it doesn't look like what it's going to end up being it just has the right proportions so that you can put the clay on or, or the material on to conform it to your way so that's one thing but if you if you use the hero's journey as a, a recipe then you're pretty much stuck with certain things. It has to be certain ways. And no story has to be a certain way. <clears throat> Almost every time that I've seen that, that has to be a certain way thing, I've also seen proof that it doesn't. So I just hate the fact that people look at it and go, oh, it has, you have to follow this. Oh, I just, oh. yeah. It's the same thing with, I don't mind Harry Potter, but... I absolutely hate when everybody professes that you have to write like like you do in Harry Potter and use that as an example for everything. Well, sorry, the beginning of Harry Potter bored the shit out of me. <laughs> it, it really did. It bored the hell out of me. I was reading it to my kids and I was like, wow, how, how do people love this? 
I, I understand you have to get past the beginning to get to that part, but that's the thing. It's like you have to be able to get past the beginning, right? It's yeah. what what we discuss all the time in writing groups is that uh, it doesn't matter if 50 pages into it, it gets exciting if you can't make it to the 50 pages to get into it, right? True. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I'm, I, I take umbrage to them being, the people being all like it has to be the hero's journey. Like the hero's journey is something that somebody broke down every story that they could find and then related it so that they could, you know, say, oh, they're all related, even though they're not really all related. They don't all fit into the categories he says they fit into. But, you know, if you make these exceptions, then they do. <laughs> okay. So basically it's that way until it's not, but then, you know, you can just conform it to this group or change that group name to fit it. Sound like something else? Hmm. Sounds like statistics. <laughs> How they often often compiled together to get a result that's desired, not to get a true result. And I guess that that's the onwards that I take with uh, the hero's journey is that it feels like it's saying you have to do this and you don't. kind of why I like watching Chuck Dixon talk about writing on his podcast because he, he really doesn't conform to anything. He just writes the hell of what he wants to write, you know? Yeah. And it's worked for him. Like, I, I kind of wish that I got into comics a long time ago as a writer and wasn't thinking about becoming an artist and in a saturated market and was more thinking about becoming a writer because they got away with so much shit that we can't get away with as writers of prose, you know? That is true. Yeah, you weren't picking a fight. <laughs> I wonder. Do you I'm feel sorry. like do you feel like you should use that as a as a um, roadmap? Do you feel like you should use that as a plot, uh, as as a like follow this step to to plot? Is that what you feel? No. No, I just think that. Uh... It's one of those things where if you know a structure, it can help you identify weak spots if you happen to be following along that. Like, you know, if you go along and you're writing a story and you realize, oh, hey, this is kind of following the hero's journey and this part's falling flat because I don't have this part. Maybe I should look at how could I make something like that that might improve this section. You know, it's, it's just having, well, I mean, think of it this way, from artwork, um, there are artists you know and you've, you've looked at and studied, and, and by knowing what they've done, you can decide to pick and choose parts of it, right? So, it's a matter of, it, the more you know, the more you can play around with it. So... If you want to write a hero's journey story, I I see nothing wrong with writing a hero's journey story. I see nothing. nothing wrong with it either. There's millions of them out there. Yeah. And if you can make yours stand out, fantastic. Um, yeah. But, you know, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say that th that's something you should do all the time. However, I will also point out 
original Star Wars followed the hero's journey. Prequels, yeah, that's what I said. Prequels did not. Actually, the prequels followed the parts of the hero's journey that he couldn't fit in. Yeah, which puts it in the wrong order. So right? it doesn't really work. It, it, doing it backwards. And, it's new villain journey. Because uh, episode one, you, who's the protagonist? In episode not, one? Yeah. It's not qui Gon Jinn because he dies before the movie's over. Spoiler alert. It's not Obi-Wan Kenobi because he's barely in the film. Uh, it's not Anakin because he's not there until about halfway through. Um, well, that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean anything. He's not the protagonist. It's not his goal. He's barely there. I mean, he's there, but they threw out so much of of what made the originals work. Um, you know, I mean, we're starting off with trade disputes. Ugh. That's super fun and exciting. Um, I don't know. I just... Well, that's because there's a the clear antagonist. I, I could have made a better antagonist. I, think, I say that I think that they're trying to make Obi-Wan the antagonist, or the protagonist, and I know that they it's not strictly right. But I think that that's what they're trying to make because in the first two movies, he's pretty much the only guy that's all the way through. It, the, the, it, the should be, it should be Anakin's story all the way, so... Uh, I think it should have been, at least at least the first film, should have been Obi-Wan Kenobi's story at the very least. Uh, I think that Qui-Gon shouldn't have died in the first one. I also think, and this may be unpopular, that uh, <clears throat> Darth Maul shouldn't have died either. Well, no, he shouldn't have died. But that's Darth that's one Maul of the problems. shouldn't have died until until Darth Vader became Darth Vader. That's how he should have became Darth Vader. Yeah, there are two things, well, three things that I have a hard time getting past. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, he did it. Thanks, Aaron. I mean, uh, yeah, you can be cut in half with a lightsaber and survive, but if you're stabbed with a weapon that instantly cauterizes the wound, you'll die within seconds. I get none of that made sense, but, uh, I would say there are three things that episode one did that pissed me off. Well, actually, the prequels in general pissed me off. I'm probably going to guess that they're not the same things as that I that I just like. <laughs> well, first off, Darth Maul should not have, should not have been dispatched the way he was. If you're not going to bring him back, like he should have been there for. At least, and they did bring uh, him back in the novel. Oh, they brought him back in in uh, in Clone Wars. So, yeah, they brought him back in the novel they, they, first. I'm not going to quote. Okay, that. well. Um. So there's, so there's that. Uh, you don't make a villain that cool just to barely have him on screen. I get that Darth Vader was barely on screen in the episode four, but he didn't die either. And he was prominent in the next two films. Uh, so there's that. Jar Jar Binks, I will have a... Sorry, I just... I get that C-3PO is always annoying, but my God, they're like, hold my beer. We'll make someone even more annoying. And then... I'm, I guess I don't feel the same way about Jar Jar Binks, but... Oh, he is... God, He's supposed to be comedy relief. I don't think it was great comedy relief, but I didn't care either way. He wasn't. He wasn't such a major part of that movie that I couldn't pretty much just ignore him. Nah, never should have been made. And yeah. then, and the the biggest problem I have with the prequels is 
The originals told us Darth Vader hunted down the Jedi. That's what we wanted to see. We want to see Darth Vader hunt down Jedi. Instead, we got Order 66, and 90% of the Jedi or more die in, you know, five minutes. Hmm. There's no hunting down of the Jedi. I don't know if I saw in the originals anything that said he hunted down the Jedi. What I was disturbed about when they talked about him is that in the very first movie, the very first time Obi-Wan said anything about it, it was uh, he was an experienced pilot when I met him. And he wasn't an experienced pilot, obviously. What do you mean? He was a pod racer. Right. Almost pod and racers. he hadn't won anything. He hadn't even completed a race until that first movie. I know. So he wasn't an experienced pilot as he claimed in the original movie. That's why they went back and remade them so that they could erase things that they didn't like. Because that's what Obi-Wan said to Luke when he was talking about the lightsaber and his father. Obi-Wan also lied a lot. Like a lot, a lot. From a certain point of view. Yeah, he lied a lot. So Princess Leia in the third movie. Of course, she was chained up. Are you talking about Return of the Jedi? Yes. What's she lie about? About Jabba's palace. What about Java's palace? She lied about it. What she said it wasn't there? What do you what she no, lied about? She was literally lying on her side. <laughs> wow, dude. That was terrible. That was absolutely it was terrible. only terrible because you took ten minutes to get it. <laughs> oh my god, that was terrible. You said, what'd she lie about? And I was like, she lied about Jabba's Jealous, Jealous I thought you were going to get her from there. <laughs> terrible, terrible, terrible. She lied about the pleasure cruise. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> oh, that was just, that was terrible. There were so many cool things that could have been. Actually, I would say that for prequels and sequels. Where they, you know, you just have some, like, there are possibilities, avenues they could have gone down. And I'm like, Count Dooku is cool. Um, he could have been cool all by himself, and he doesn't really do. Like they cram too much. You got Count Dooku, you got Grievous, you know, you got all these things going on. It was just he got too convoluted too quickly, um, and it, it just—it's kind of a mess for the sequel or for the prequels. Sequels were just God; they really had no play on it. It shows. And if they wanted to do the, spoiler alert, cloning of, of uh, Emperor Palpatine, that should have been laid out at the beginning. We did not need Episode 4, Part 2. We just needed, really, the third film plotted out for three films. That would have been a more interesting sequel trilogy. But... They didn't have any plan. And then you have things like I was I'm okay with you know 
Luke doesn't want to do this anymore. Okay, fine. Whatever. People change over time. Whatever. It's not the same person. I I'm get not it. Even I Mark Hamill was okay with it. Well, I just... When, at the end of episode... Uh, let me see. Eight? When they're going through and... You know, your, your parents sold you. You're nobody. And, you know... I was okay with that. I thought that was a good thing. Like, it shouldn't have to be where you're somebody special. Like, if you're talking about the force, you know, surrounds all of us and is in all of us, then why is it that it seems like there are only certain families that really get to do it? You know, just, I was okay with that. I had no problem. Um, but yeah, they just... I don't know. They kind of listened to fans too much, I think. Um, decided to retcon everything with that ninth film, and it just... Why? Like, just... And the third, the ninth film, it, the biggest problem is that it came out of nowhere. Um, and if they had built that up where, you know, the, the Empire's fallen and all this stuff, and but there's some weird group doing things and Kylo Ren's kind of in charge of them and you know, Kylo Ren That's could have been a much better character. There is no sequel. What? I said I still stand by there is no sequel. It only do. That's how I feel. Like they're going to make another Matrix film and I'm like, why? You haven't done a good one since the first one. Like, the second one in the wasn't terrible until you put it with the third one and then it's like yeah that was kind of dumb and the fourth one was terrible so I can't imagine this fifth one's going to be any better Attention to the chat. Stream on us. I said that. Hour. Oh no, that's what 10 minutes ago. Probably I said time. that. Oh, I thought you were talking. I don't know. But I guess no. I was saying your opinion or something. Not somebody else's opinion. Oh, and Aaron, I don't think, you know, again, Darth Maul was cut in half and had to survive on his own first. Like, he's brought well, back to death here later on by his brother. Why couldn't he use the Force to put himself back together? Well, my problem is, is well, twofold now, because they've, made, they've compounded the problem. In Episode 9, oh, wait, look, we can heal people with the Force, which has always been part of the video games. But never really been part of of uh, movies, which means why is it if you could heal yourself, why did Qui Gon Jinn ever die? But again, if Darth Maul can be cut in half, literally in half, and survive, why can't Qui Gon Jinn get a hole in his belly and survive at least for a while until he can reach medical treatment? So, and they're already on a planet that has advanced technology. Qui Gon Jinn never should have died if Darth Maul's not going to die. It just really it, it it seems like you're you're not following the rules of your magic system. about the sequels. Not really. <laughs> I, thought, I thought the first one had potential. 
I, I really like the idea of the stormtrooper that went rogue. Yeah. But yeah, they, if they developed they, that. They made him comedy relief. You know, they just didn't make him important at all. Right. But I kind of think that was a missed opportunity and it sucked. Yep. I agree. I That's think a... that. I don't think that Ray originally was supposed to be thought between teens clone. I think that was the last minute thing that they did <clears throat> to just say, oh, everybody's everybody's uh, conspiracy theories are wrong. So they just made a wing little fucking answer. The second of the sequels was just totally stupid. The whole, our plan is to run to a planet that only has one way on and one way off, or, and it's the same yeah. way. And as many people can die on the way as want to so that we can trap ourselves on the planet and hope help is going to come for us. Right. Yeah. That's a great plan. And strategically, strategically, the guys that actually know something about battle or their star pilots are uh, berated and belittled and made to look stupid and incompetent when this blue-haired general who has nothing, no idea of how to actually plan and execute a battle doesn't fill in any of her subordinates on her plan. Yeah, it's... And then my plan is to kamikaze at the last minute so that everybody can get trapped on the planet and die. And they killed Leia off for that. <laughs> Leia was a better battle for me. way possible. Leia you had an opportunity player. to do it with dignity, like, you know, the ship gets hit, she's, you know, and there, you know, she was on it, she's, she's gone now. But no, we're going to drag it out. It's like, that's, you know, have the Mary Poppins moment. And, uh, yeah, I just... <sighs> really wish they would have yeah. had a better plan. Well, they didn't have a better plan because <laughs> they didn't have a military presence in charge, really. They had skewed using a military presence. I, I, I never got past the beginning where Poe leads this attack on the bombers in space, like bombers yeah. dropping bombs in space in, in gravity less <laughs> gravity less space. But then he doesn't know better than to fly so close that if there's a critical, you know, mishap that not all the ships get involved in the critical mishap. I just yeah. that's not believable to me. Not an experienced pilot, no way.
Yeah, I don't know. Star Wars. I gave up on Star Wars after that. Well, hey, in uh, 13 days, we can watch Rebel Moon Part 2. Hey, Jason, I watched Episode 7 in the theaters and haven't touched Star Wars since. Yeah. <laughs> it could be good if they would have better writers. It could be good if they return to what Star Wars is instead of what their agenda wants to be. Well, yeah. That's the thing. To get rid of and, and this is going to sound screwed up, but there's just as much uh, left-wing politics in the original Star Wars, but they didn't beat us over the head with it. Like they didn't cause them to day us with it, and they didn't, you know. They, they just know. showed what they thought was evil, you know. Yeah. Jay wants to know what we thought about the new Dune movies. I loved them. Well, I only saw the first one, so uh, mostly I loved it. I mean, really, mostly. There's little things, but it's. They're little things because I read the books a long time ago and I developed certain certain images in my head about things, how things should be. So it's hard for me to get past some of them. And I also know where the story is going and the little changes that they make. That will affect that kind of bug me. But I don't think they picked the right person for Paul Atreides. I mean, anyone anyone could fill that role, I guess, but I just that's not the person I envision. And I don't think they picked the right person for Cheney at all. But you know, again, that's because I read the books and I got a different picture of her in my head. <clears throat> Guess pretty much most of the other cast, I don't mind too much. I, I actually pictured Duncan Idaho completely <laughs> different too, but I think, I think he was portrayed, portrayed well. And well enough to overcome my bias. But don't go spreading that around because people will think that I just like movies and I don't. <laughs> I'm, I'm thrilled they're going to have a third one. You know. I think they're, I mean the books are great right up. I would love to see uh, Dune Messiah done right. Because when they when they did it for the Sci-Fi Channel, um, they they were really close with Dune when they did the Sci-Fi Channel miniseries. But when they did the Dune Messiah, which they m r ran right into Children of Dune and called it Children of Dune, they really kind of screwed it up because there was a lot of things in Dune Messiah that never made it into the movie and a lot of things in Children of Dune that suffered for it. So I would love to see Dennis Villeneuve do Dune Messiah. If, if he stays as true to it as he's done so far to what I've seen him doing. Well, <laughs> funny, funny enough, because you haven't seen the second film. Ah, but... that makes me worry about where it's going. Well, there's one slight change 
that oh, uh it's not a slave change is it you're just trying to be nice <laughs> well you know uh all you have the knife all sister and uh how she got that nickname yeah was by killing the baron that's really hard to do when you're not born yet Right, well, technically, yeah, she... She wasn't born yet in, in the film. So, that whole... No, I, I was just thinking in the book, she wasn't born when the... Uh, when when part one ended, right? She was... Right. She was Jessica not. was pregnant with her. Right. And she's pregnant with her throughout the entire second film. So oh, that that kind of sucks. Like she talks, she communicates with Jessica, and and Paul has a dream about her. Uh, but yeah, they don't they don't reveal her really. And some of that stuff at the end was always kind of fun, where. You know, the, the Bene Gesserit are just appalled by this girl. Um, right. And, you know, that was always kind of fun. So, that was the biggest issue I had with it. But, in the grand scheme of things, Alias can still be in the next film. She, you know, so, she didn't kill the Baron. Um... I mean, the Baron still ends up dead. Um, it's just that one, you know, like she could be born off screen. Um, or that could be like an opening or I don't know. I mean, or maybe she'll be the focus of the second, of the third film. I don't know. Uh, but it was a, it's kind of a. Yeah, it changes things. Yeah. But, and that's the kind of change that pisses me off because that's a key thing. Well, I don't know. I don't know if it's really key. I it's do. interesting. Considering where where it picks up in Doom Messiah, yeah. Did you see the sci-fi uh, miniseries? Yeah. I like the way that they used her in that. She was like the creepy little poltergeist old lady. Yeah. <laughs> At the end of it, it was very good to me. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm upset. I mean, I'm not upset, but I think that was... Uh, <laughs> Kind of a missed opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I'd say I'm disappointed, but at the same time, I'm like, you know, I can see it can still work, and I don't. Everything about that character, um, you know, the way she's created, I guess, is the best way to put it. All of that still applies. So. Yeah, she's not going to kill the Baron. I get it. But the Baron's still dead. She's yeah, still... but that's... Her killing the Baron has, has lingering effects on her story. Well, I don't I don't know if it's the killing of the Baron that does that, or the... Oh, yeah. Structure... I, I don't want to give anything away in case he makes the movie, but... Where does she go, and what happens to her? You know? Well, I, I get that, but I think that has with something the to do Baron. with. I don't think it's the Baron, the killing of the Baron, that does that to her, though. I kind of do. <laughs> well, that's cool, but I don't think it's 
it's not defined that way in the book. I'm not saying it's right. not I think possible. It is. I mean, we're we're, it's not. we're in disagreement on that, but yeah, because I'm. It's it's not. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was in the one I read. Okay, you find that for me. I'll I'll be impressed when it says she goes crazy because she killed her uncle, not because of what she was exposed to in the womb. She was he was possessing her, so that's what I was trying to avoid to say. But his ghost was possessing her because he she killed him. No, it's because of what she was exposed to in the womb, <laughs> not because she killed him. If Paul had killed him, he still could have possessed her just the same way. Because it's I think not he would actually have him. Tried to possess Paul. I again, it's it's because of the water of life ritual, not because she killed him. Okay, I'm going to ask another technical thing. So, like the the cracks that you made towards the light, right? Yeah. Very fine, very narrow spaces. I can understand wanting a Some of them. a Some narrow. Of them. Huh? Some of them. Some of them are wider. I just yeah, but I'm, I'm saying you, you, some of them are require a certain amount of control. But some of the wider is it just you don't want to switch pens because like that's a very small tip for some of the areas that you're covering. Oh, so it, uh, I'm so. Hmm. You see what now. I'm saying? I mean, I'm just, I'm just curious. I'm, so, what I'm trying to do is get the small, small areas. Right. Like this small area. Uh. I was coloring up to that edge so that I would have control on that edge. Okay. Like, I didn't intend to color all of this with it. I'm just okay. intending to color in between the little cracks and stuff like that. Where where it feeds off into solid blackness, I'm, I'm probably not going to use this pen. But I do have a few of them, so if I went through it, it's not a big deal. Uh, the main thing is if I use like Higgins Black, which I thought about doing also. Yeah. Uh, it's a different kind of black and it's shinier on the surface. Okay. And it should be all one. Sheen. Well, I mean, when you copy it, you won't tell the difference. But like if somebody ever bought the original artwork or because I have the original artwork, you know, I will know the difference. Okay. And this is not, uh, this is not a fine pen. This is just not a big, bold pen either. This is the, uh, Fudinosuke, uh, Tombow Fudinosuke Soft. Of the hard tip. Okay. Um, I don't mind going through them because the hard tip is the one that I would probably do the details with. Yeah. The soft tips are usually they kind of bleed out or they uh, spread. Okay. I haven't decided how much I'm going to do in the hard tip, how much I'm going to do in the soft tip, or 
how much I'm going to do with a Copic Black or or maybe just uh, paint some uh, gouache or quill gouache on it. What I'm all I'm trying to do right now is kind of nail the edges in the smaller stuff. Okay. More of an answer than you wanted, I'm sure. No, I, I was I was very it's interested. Probably not the answer you wanted. <laughs> I don't know. No, no, that's exactly what I wanted. I just wanted to know, like, I. I also didn't think we're going to, you know, like I'm going to do the whole inking tonight. That's not going to happen. So I, I'm just noodling around while we were talking and trying to get some of the solid. Because this stuff, these little cracks and stuff like that, they're they're doodles. I'm just playing around. I, there's, there's no right or wrong way to do them, except for you don't want to do so much of them. It's distracting to what's going on. So like if I put in too many, like in here I've got a lot. If I look at that after I color that black like this and go, that's too much, then I can make parts of those disappear. Right. But I don't want it so busy that you ignore what's going on in in her. Got it. <clears throat> well, then I was just, yeah, I was just curious. Yeah, I was kind of, you know, just trying to give you an answer. Okay. Just trying to give you an accurate answer, and well, I don't one care. Of the great the about being, <laughs> one of the I great just, things about being an artist is you uh, you can change your mind <laughs> at any point in time, right? Yeah. yeah, I just I find the process to be interesting, so I like to ask about it. Yeah, sometimes I'm just not right in the head and it shows. <laughs> so I want to change up the markings too and make them look a little bit more random. That's why there's bullet holes and little small kind of ring dents and and then there's these cracks so i i want to have them look random and i as i go i look at some of them and i go okay well that's like that like that and that almost all in a line so i'm gonna have to move some of them around or erase one or Okay. And then I don't want to go one, two, three, so you know, you want to make sure that they're they look more random. Nothing is truly random. Humans all all work with patterns. Oh wow. We may not recognize the patterns, but we do. I didn't even know if I was going to ink this or not. Like, I didn't know if I was going to scan the DNA and color it on or uh, ink it on my digital program or what. But I really like doing things traditionally as much as I can.
So, Rich, you never watched Andor, did you? Nope. There is... A char- oh, first off, I recommend that series. Although, if you're going to watch it, you need to set aside like at least three episodes at a time. Because... Like, the first episode just ends. There's no ending to it. And the second episode is like that. It just ends. And then the third episode kind of wrapped up that that character, or that story arc. So it was kind of... Really, the first three episodes are one episode. That's kind of how it works. But one of the characters... Um, there's a theory about him that he's he's either a failed Jedi or a failed Sith. That uh, and and the idea of him being another Sith Lord that is just pissed that Palpatine got power. I think is a wonderful. I'm sure they won't. I'm, they won't explore it. It won't work. It won't turn out that he's actually Sith. But it's such a neat concept of here's this guy that's that basically starts the rebellion. And I mean he has this really big long speech. It's a neat speech about how he has to use the tools of his enemy and all this stuff. And how he's damned and, and he knows that, but he'll fight this you know, for his entire life. And he'll never get to see it to the end, but he doesn't care and all this stuff. And I'm just like, this would be so much cooler if he's a Sith. If, if he's having to, you know, develop this rebellion because a rival Sith got power. That, to me, was just... It's one of those things where I'm like, okay... If I can figure out a, a, a novel that's not Star Wars, but where I can have, <laughs> you know, basically you have two sides and, you know, you're supposed to be following one side because they're good, but really your protagonist is not. If I can figure out how to make that work, I will. That would definitely be a story I'm interested in writing. Hmm. Yeah, Aaron, you're right. He flies a ship with, with lightsabers, which are red, by the way. But, uh, I mean, they're not really lightsabers, but they basically are. And, uh, yeah, it's just... God. It would be so cool if he was Sith. But, who knows? I would say Andor was probably the best Star Wars production since this. Well, since Rogue One, and it it never. I mean, people just didn't watch it, and it's kind of sad because I don't think it's going to get a second season. But it was. Wonder why they didn't watch it. It uh, might have been burned by Disney, you know, like every single oh, time I know. That they watch it. I know. I get it. But, you know, I can help. It is so funny just how much the ink changes the look.
I agree. <laughs> I don't know if I'd say it's funny though, because you know, I, I just I sweat it. The uh... <laughs> when I was younger and could do you know portraits in a half an hour, then I didn't sweat this shit. But now I worry if I get a tremor or you know. The uh... I mean originally, so you had model up front and. And she was already darker and, and I think better defined than Shepard was. But then you start putting the black down and then all of a sudden she doesn't look anywhere near as defined. Like it's, and I'm sure when you put the ink in, it'll, she'll be defined again. But it's just. <laughs> when I, the when I ink her, yeah, she's going to stand out that much more. Yeah, it's the contrast between, you know, it's just the different stages it, it, it's interesting how it changes more than just what you're working on, but what you also, what's near it. I don't know. I just, I find that kind of interesting. I'll take it. <laughs> I guess. I find it interesting too. I think it's a lot more interesting when you've got some investment in the character or the image or whatever. But remember, this is the first time I've actually drawn these characters instead of just kind of sketching them for, right. you know, like loose reference or, or planning them out or whatever. And this is the first time I've actually drawn her at all, really. Like the, the first sketch, not even close. <laughs> but that tends to happen when you, you know, we're talking and developing the character as we went, so. We still haven't had any feedback on on this either way, you know, about whether they like the character design or whatever, right? Just like a cool drawing, but that that doesn't mean if you like the character design or whatever, right? Well, you know, part of me would argue that uh, well, design is <laughs> a visual aspect, and, and there's part of that, but also it helps. Once you know more about the story, uh, so see them. Well, you know the visual is a sale. Yeah, if, if they don't like how it looks, they're not gonna they're not gonna pick it up. No matter. That's true. Well, more likely. Yeah. Does Eli have school on Monday? Uh, not if he's continuing to be like he is. No, I, I just mean in general. Like, uh, I don't we know. Have a, I, mean, I, I think he, I think he does. But. We have a, a really, like, so we have an e-learning day and we have 15 minute classes and they're all supposed to be done by 11:15. That way people can go out and see the eclipse. 
Oh, yeah, the Eclipse. Uh, I don't know. I think, you know, I, now that you mentioned it, I think they did. I don't know. I think they did. Or is that, maybe it was you talking about with pretty much closing down. That I'm thinking. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of schools in this area. Because I guess we're getting. I know. We're supposed to have a really good view of it. So I know that she ordered uh, the Eclipse glasses. For yep. everyone. Huh? I said, yeah. She's right into it. There's, you know, there's going to be it's a super show. It's not going to happen again until. God, I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> like, I don't care that much. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> I have a May, like, a friend of mine, um, uh, girl I graduated with she does uh, uh, like real estate and Airbnb management and stuff and she said that uh, all of her Airbnbs throughout like a huge section of the, of, of the state they're all booked uh, and hotels are all booked and yeah I guess we are expecting lots of people to uh, I guess they were selling tickets to, uh, I think it was, uh, the Speedway track. You know where they do oh, the yeah. 500? You know, they're selling tickets so you can watch it there. And I'm just like, okay. Um, um, where are you guys supposed to be at on its path, you know? I don't remember. <laughs> It's important to you, too, huh? <laughs> yeah. Aaron said that they're holding kids longer to watch the eclipse at school. That's weird. Like, it's supposed to hit here, I think, in the middle, like, I think around noon. That's why well, they want everyone out. Like, they don't even, like, a lot of times they'll say you can come in and and do your Google Meets from your classroom if you want, which there are people who like that. No, I'm not going to say anything about that, but uh, I certainly don't. But uh, they were like, yeah, you have to be out of the building by noon. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you have to I, you know, my, first, my first class starts at 9 a.m. that day. I'm going to roll out of bed around 8.30. <laughs> That's another thing, and I didn't even think about looking. I don't think. I don't think they put passing periods in on the schedule. So I'm supposed to go from one Google Meet to another one instantaneously. It's, it's never going to happen. But, oh, well. My schedule is pretty good for that because I have one class, then I have a prep period, then I have two classes, then I have one. Well, so we're not going to have lunch. So I guess I'll have one class, prep period, two classes, prep period, two more classes. So it's not terrible but yeah I just thought about that it is I don't think they gave us a quote passing period huh. oh well I wonder if they give you Google cheese with Google me That was not funny. It wasn't meant to be. It's like like soiling green and shit. <laughs> uh, hmm. 
I was in a band called Blue Man Cheese once. Nice. Guess that's why I thought of the relationship of Google Meet. <laughs> It's one Which of those. obviously funnier for me than you. But yeah. Hey, I'll take it where I can get it. The, uh, one of the odd mental things that I have is that I tend to, like, I, I, I collect random band names, like, like fictional bands. I just, for some odd reason, I enjoy making up names for them. That's so weird because I'm like completely the opposite with fictional <laughs> band names. Well, no, like that's what drove me crazy about uh, the Vampire Lestat. Yeah. Like they had that fictional band name, and I'm like, it's not even a fucking believable band name. And then all of a sudden, the '90s happened, or now the 2000s happened, <laughs> and they became believable band names, but they were just as dumb. Well, so like, if I was going to be, so here's an example. I think there should be a punk band that does covers of like 50s music. And it should shit all over those covers. They should be terrible. That's why they're a punk band. And they should be called The Pigeons. It's a great band name. They crap all over. And my joke was lame. I'm just saying, pigeons, great. Or if you want to, that's wanna... not a fucking punk band name. <laughs> oh, it is. No, no, that's more like an alternative band name. And then uh, for some some uh, emo music, like you know, My Chemical Romance or something, uh, I would have. New Scar for Monday. It's a great band name. But it definitely has the emo vibe. The Screaming Speed Bumps. That'd be a good name for a band. Or anyone K walking. <laughs> That's more of a punk name, actually. <laughs> Like traditionally, I like to collect band names and names for for restaurants because I don't know why I just have ideas.
So, out of curiosity, and just to talk about things that no one else will know anything about, because that makes for good viewing. But uh, <laughs> that that novella that I just submitted, the the purple hair comment. Hey, I laughed at that because I hadn't thought anything about it. But then, like. <laughs> Now I'm wondering if it's like two on the nose. <laughs> so, what does it matter? Like it was pretty on the nose in fucking Star Wars, and nobody cared. <laughs> That's true. <clears throat> it was kind of fun writing that. I mean, because part of me is like, like framing things and like trying to i don't know it's just weird definitely taking a perspective that wasn't me i guess and then still trying to make it sound authentic and real and believable and not be preachy but We'll see if I do better this time. Well, I'm going to say if you're going to, this is probably the story that's going to do it. Well, I hope I at least get honorable mention versus rejection. God. I think you put too much stock in that shit. I but... don't put a lot of stock in it. It's just... Before Dave Wolverton's death, I was on a certain trajectory, and then he died, and that trajectory just dropped. And like I felt like I was honing in on the game, I guess. And then now I'm, I'm not. Yeah, you're in a different game. <laughs> yeah, well, that's just one of those things. It's just annoying. I mean, it's a good learning experience. No, I I agree. But that's what I'm saying. Like, that's. That's where you're at. That's what you're, that's what you're involved in. You know? Yeah. So you, you have to accept that you've got to take your bumps. <laughs> right. Because that's your, that's the only thing you're being guaranteed to be getting out of this. Yeah. And in a way that's, I mean, It's, it's not a bad, I mean, it's not a pleasant experience getting rejections. And it's not, you know, all that stuff. And even when you, you know, get semifinalists, you know, so I was in the top 16. It still sucks because it's still a rejection. But it's gotten me to write more often. It's gotten me to have more, you know, I've, I've been able to send out more stuff. I have stories, you know, if. Um, if they haven't found a home but a new home opens up you know I've got stuff to actually send out so <clears throat> you know in the grand scheme of things I'd, I I wouldn't necessarily say it's a bad it, it's not a bad contest in any way um, so I'm, I mean, I'm not trying to down talk the contest a lot of people like it a lot of people yeah. you know but I realized at some point that it would never be it would never be what I wanted it to be. It would never do I would never do what I wanted to do with it. And it's a market that I actually don't successfully write for because I can't change my visions and I can't write with their limitations so i'm not recommending that anybody not do it i'm just saying that you know i i realized a long time ago that that wouldn't have been for me so it's i i think it's a heartbreaker for a lot of people because they go into it expecting that it's going to be judged on merit and i don't think it is um and I'll leave it at that. 
because some people will disagree with me and some people will absolutely agree with me and I, I'm just fine with that. I, wow. I'd like it to be different, but and I'm not, you know, I know that it's there's no names attached, but they are certainly reading the story for the story's intent. Yeah, that's... For the story's I, I was, themes. Um... Yeah, I, 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 I would say that there is, uh, there is merit that factors in, but there are other things that factor in as well, which tip the scales. That's how I'd put it. Like, there are just, I'm sorry, I don't care if you don't know my name, you can still see is this a you know a left-leaning story or is it a right-leaning story Correct. and i'm sorry the left-leaning ones do better i don't think they're necessarily oh. better written <laughs> um, we're totally in agreement on those those things but uh they still have to have um some merit to them so i i know well, they I just, I've seen. I can name one. Seen, <laughs> no, I'm saying you and I have both seen slush piles. We know this kind of stuff that comes in. So we know there's a lot of bad stuff. So it's got to be better than that. And, uh, and I've seen outright rejections. For way better stories than I've seen place. Yeah, I, and, and again, I'm. I that's think, not merit, dude. I'm, I don't. I don't care. That's not fucking merit. Well, and again, I. I think. Uh, I think. I think we disagree on the degree, but that's about it. On the degree. Yeah, because I. If they judge it on merit, it doesn't matter. The story is good, it'll be a good story. If they don't judge it on merit and they judge it on principle, well, then so it happens if you have two stories. Principle. If you have two stories that are of equal merit, but one of them has a political stance that the judges aren't necessarily keen to push, whereas the other one does have a, a, a political slant to it that the judges are more happy to endorse you know which one they're going to do I mean that's so I'm saying that you can have merit and it leads up to a certain point but there are other factors yeah but that changes what I actually said I said I've seen stories that suck place and stories that were excellent would be rejected in the same series so they're not two stories that have the same merit and their different political stances. They're two stories that have totally different, totally different uh, skill levels, totally different success or failure in the actual story. And it didn't matter. As someone who submits, yes, they've always chosen stories that weren't as good as mine. <laughs> not what I'm saying. I'm not talking not about great. my own story. Mine were better. Yeah, that's that's a faulty thing. <laughs> that's that's a straw man argument. I'm not saying. I'm, I'm not saying you were. I'm well. saying I'm saying I'm saying there's proof. Yeah, I mean, but it sounds it sounds a lot like you're saying that it's because I had a story that failed. That's yeah. not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about somebody else's story that was excellent, that didn't place at all, versus somebody's I, story that was complete garbage. Because I actually saw it in all of its forms, and it was still complete garbage. Placing. Oh, I. I. Uh, that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's not the same thing as two stories that are the same merit but different political interests. I'm talking I, about skill. I I I can't argue that they have chosen some stinkers. Yep. Um. <laughs> they they definitely have. I mean, I'm so. I'm not I, talking I like about my own stories. I'm not talking about my own stories in this. I'm talking I was. about stories that I've read from other people that were excellent and should have won. 
I'm talking about my stories. I don't mind yeah. saying it. I'm, I'm <laughs> specifying that I am not. Okay. Okay. And, and I, I'm not disagreeing. I'm, I'm, God, there was one story. I, I always think of it as the feminist Mary Poppins story that is just wish fulfillment um, from a feminist perspective. Um, and I just, yeah, I'm like, okay, whatever. This is garbage. It never should, whatever. But, you know, there have been other ones where I'm like, this is, this is not good. Um, but, you know, that's kind of subjective and can't really prove it. My biggest problem, I think, my mis- and it's my mistake. Yeah, it's you not- can't prove it because taste is subjective, right? Right. I mean, I just, I can't. I, I I think you're right. They've chosen some stories. It's just like, like I've, and I've gone to their forums and like I started breaking down stories that had gone in there. Um, you know, to publicly say, you know, this is what I see that's going on well, specifically, because I wasn't trying to be negative. Um, and I, when I got to that, you know, the feminist Mary Poppins one, I was just like, I, I, I can't, I can't find anything here that I can say this is quality writing. I was like, if someone, like, I would love for someone to explain it because I'm not seeing it. And, and no one could explain that one. I was like, yeah, that, uh so, but whatever. But I think my biggest issue, and I think you pointed it out to me, um, and I think a lot of people probably make this exact same mistake, is that they get involved with writers of the future. That's the contest we're talking about. I don't want to be coy about it. They get, you know, they start submitting, and I recommend you submit. I'm, I'm going to say right here, I recommend submitting to writers of the future, because you might as well, because if you win... It's, it's good it's practice a, to write stories for a deadline. It's yeah, really good. It's, it's a deadline. It's It's... He gets professionally judged. The payoff, if you win, is fantastic. So, and the benefits. Yeah, but more than just the pay. Like there, there, are, there are definite benefits to if you win. So, I will be the first one to say you should. You know, if you're a writer, you should be trying to submit here. But I got so fixated on submitting to writers in the future that I didn't really. It was developing a catalog of stories. That's great. But I wasn't writing a novel, really. Because um, I was so focused on getting a short story that was going to work. Instead of worrying about, let's write a novel. And and I think, professionally, that's probably hurt me more than anything else. Like, it's good to be writing short stories and for a deadline. And don't well, get me if wrong. If you want to write a novel, and you don't practice writing a novel that's not going to do you any good yeah and that's that's brandon sanderson's advice like if you if you want to write novels don't write short stories write novels and that's kind of yeah i need to start really i've got my novel ideas i i really should be focusing more on those and i have it i agree and, and that's uh there's at least one I want to see finish. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I have any stake in this. Oh. Yeah. I definitely don't want people to get the idea. I mean, I've talked... I'm not going to feel like Writers of the Future is perfect because it's not, as we've discussed. And, uh, I, I, but for me, it has this, uh, it's, it's, it's pluses outweigh its minuses for where I am. Other than I really should be working on a novel. But yeah, or, you know, or what your goal is as a writer is important. And yeah. 
I think a lot of people lose track of that because they think that they have to win Writers of the Future because it's such a big deal in the science fiction fantasy writing community. But while people are trying to win Writers of the Future, people are regularly writing novels and publishing them. Yeah. And that's what some of them really want to do. And I've said before, too, that I know that there's quite a few winners of Writers of the Future that stopped writing after they won Writers of the Future. They didn't progress and write novels, or they wrote one novel and they were supposed to write three novels, or they wrote two novels that took them 15 years after they won this contest, right? So, like, the contest isn't a guarantee, but it's good practice, and it's good practice to write regularly and write for a deadline. Because if you're writing a novel or if you're writing a short story, there's always going to be deadlines. I, I just, it doesn't matter what market you're writing for, there's, there's always going to be a deadline. Yeah. And I, I've said a couple of times, I don't say don't write for writers of the future. Don't do it because that's not true like it it's it's the answer for a lot of people it's the market that a lot of people are looking for me it's just not the market that i that i meant to write for and i and i know that because i wouldn't normally be writing for that market like for what they're trying to publish and they're trying to publish and we should probably put that out there too uh something that can be uh, published in school libraries. So they're not looking for adult fiction. They're not looking for uh, fiction that has curse words in it or, uh, well, at least too many. Like, two is too many, though. So. Oh, you're absolutely not allowed to use the F bomb. They've publicly declared that. Like, there's no F bomb. Oh, that's a new thing. Yeah. No F bomb. Any use of the F-bomb is an automatic rejection. All right, well, there you go. But that's that's what I was saying. Like, we should, you know, kind of give them an idea that that's, that's part of the... Part of the reason that I don't write for them. It's not that I have to use F-bombs or whatever, but, like, if, if my characters act and behave a certain way, I... I want to be able to, to make them act and behave that, that way. And I don't think that it should be limited to what they accept or that it should be limited to what uh, a fifth grader should read, you know? Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, my kids, by the time that they were in fifth grade, pretty much were, were reading regular novels. And they were told that if they could read X amount of novels and talk to me about what was in them, so I knew that they were comprehending what was in them other than just bad words, <laughs> then they could pretty much read whatever they wanted to. Um, I don't think that hurt them one bit. You know, I would say this about Writers of the Future. Their forum is actually really, really good. <laughs> no, I mean, it, like I've seen people get crappy, like back when they had Hat Rack. Um, and I, I don't see that there. Uh, or very, very rarely have I seen that. Uh, seen what? Where people start getting kind of crappy towards other people. And, you know, getting into arguments and, oh, I've, and stuff. I've seen a couple of them. <laughs> well, I mean... It ha uh, I've seen them between winners. Well, I, they have I've differences seen. of opinions and... Well, I mean, I think the worst I've seen 
Well, when I was trying to break down the stories, there's a bit of a thing that happened there where people kind of, and it got shut down pretty fast. Um, that was the worst. And that's actually got one of the winners involved, too. Um, one of your favorite ones, actually. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've seen that favorite one argue with a few people. Yeah. But, I mean, I've because never seen it. That person's opinion is more important than anybody else's opinion. Well, I haven't really seen anyone get, like, I've just never really seen it get that nasty. I mean, I the meanest comment I've ever, like, gotten was, there was one guy on there I did a You saw it got me at Hat Track? Oh, at Hat Rack, it got really mean. Really? I never saw that. Oh, God, yeah. Hell, I've, I, I've it never once. seen it get mean. They, they, they were distant. You know, they were distant and kind of cold sometimes. Yeah. But I've never seen them get mean at anybody. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I have never. I mean, again, not, not the Hat Rack people, but the, you know, the schmoes like me contributing or posting stuff. Not the, not the site. Well, I know what you're saying. You're saying the numbers. Yeah. Okay. But I, I just, I've never seen that to, no. to what you're talking about. I mean, I've, oh, yeah, I've I seen see. people make comments and, you know, make assumptions, but oh, no, I've never they, seen what meaning. Like, I saw a couple people new. here dripping away. Hey, Jay wants to know your uh, general impression of a song of ice and fire. Uh, Uh-oh. This is going to be long. Uh, <laughs> it's gonna be I long. Have, I have no opinion on this. Is that what you said? It's gonna be long. Well, because I think I know your opinion on this, and it it's well. It, it depends it'll on what you're talking about the books or the movie or the, the TV show. Like, I I stopped watching the TV show because it was basically just smut. Um. No, I mean, uh, I, so aside from Martin as a person, I think he's an excellent, uh, character writer, but I think because he's a pantser that he creates so many characters that he traps himself. And actually, Dave Wolverton, Dave Barlin, sorry, uh, he was saying that, and this was a prediction, that he had written so many characters that he was going to have to kill them off. Because there was no way that he would be able to wrap it up in what he said that he was going to wrap it up in. And what do you know? He started killing characters off. But, so what do I think of it? I think... There's a, a lot of cool stuff in it. And then there's a lot of meandering in it also. Um, it's kind of like Robert Jordan. I mean, when I first started reading Robert Jordan, the Wheel of Time series, I loved everything about it. Of course, I was younger. And it was like, it was like eating a chocolate cake with chocolate frosting and chocolate filling. It was like there was just so much in it. And I kind of got that feeling with Martin too. Uh, but he started breaking his word doing the same thing as, as Jordan did. And Jordan died before he finished his work. And that's my biggest problem with those is that they have these massive volumes and before they finish they start prequels or they start, you know, telling stories that so they they just got bored with the stories and they didn't they didn't have an ending to them. And I guess that's probably what you're talking about, Brad, is that my opinion on them is that they're never going to end. He's he never intended for them to end because if he had intended for them to really truly end he never finished his commitment and ended yet. He supposedly told HBO how he wanted to end that. And when they did, there was such a backlash that this is my belief that 
he didn't want to write it because there was such a backlash on how they hated the ending. Not, not you know, most writers don't get that opportunity to see how an ending is going to work with an audience before, before they actually write the ending, right? So it's kind of messed up. Like I'm I thinking think, of a, a marketing for that. How do you market a book where everyone's seen the ending to it already? Well, you know how he marketed it. It was like, well, that's not the ending I'm going to write. And then he's never finished it. He hasn't finished any of them. He's <laughs> the, the he last said, one. Winter is coming or whatever that was supposed to be put out last never came out and then he wrote a prequel and then House of the Dragon came out which is basically him writing prequel stuff. So and I've I've heard it said that some of these fans don't care about ending it. They just like the characters and just like the world. Well it's not a story unless it has an ending. And to me that kind of rips it off because I I was I spent 20 years reading that shit to get, you know, no closure, to get no answers. Yeah. Or to get a false answer that was rushed because they wanted to finish the season out, you know? I I felt very much like they kind of ripped us off. And Martin, he's made his millions. He doesn't have to finish anything. And when the fans confronted them about it, what did he say? I don't know. I don't have to. I don't have to do shit. Oh, yeah, you don't have to do shit. But I'm not buying any more of your shit. <laughs> because you can't come keep your word. You can't, you know, finish a story. That's not what I'm in it for. Like, if I buy a book, I want to read the end. If I buy a trilogy, I want to read the end. And what it's done, and actually, I was talking about this with uh, some other writers that I read. What it's done is it's made people not want to buy larger series because none of these guys that are writing the larger series are finishing what they said they were going to finish. So the readership don't trust that anyone's going to finish, you know, a trilogy or whatever. So they don't want to buy it until they see it's done. But if it's not going to sell, then nobody's going to finish it. And no no uh publisher is going to want to buy something that the public's not buying and the public's not buying it because you know it's not finished so that's that's where i'm at on a song and fire and ice it, it changed the industry quite a bit and how many people you know brett that are writing trilogies Oh, yeah. Like, everybody wants to write a trilogy. And this is the thing. Nobody wants to buy trilogies. Because <laughs> they're never finished. So, you know, where's, where's that? <laughs> you know, I, I stopped reading them before the last one he put out because he said that he was going to put out five and when he got to the fifth book it was too big and he had to break it down into two books and then it was I'm going to have to write two more books to finish this story so like I said I, I think it's a, it turned into a cash cow at some point and I don't think he really wanted it to end. But now he doesn't have to worry about that. Because he's got the whole House of the Dragon thing going on. And <clears throat> it's unfortunate we had, you know, side effects for people who could be writing brilliant fiction that we'll never get to see. Because nobody wants to buy a trilogy that ain't finished anymore. So you, you're going to have to write the entire trilogy <laughs> and and advertise it as part one of the entire trilogy that's already written. <laughs> you're going to have to assure the general public that it's already been done. 
They're just waiting for publication dates. And that, that wing lies at those two doors, really. Robert Jordan died, so he has, has an excuse. <laughs> he, he shouldn't, he shouldn't have, you know, gone back and started, uh, started the, the prequels, which he did with New Spring, until he finished his epic. But you can't blame the guy because he died, you know, and he was dying while he was writing. So, yeah, that's hard. And when Brandon Sanderson finished it, he said that Robert Jordan had like a million words of notes. So it wasn't like he, you know, just blew the whole thing off, which it really seems like the other author we mentioned did. Like, you can't blame a guy for dying. Well, you can, but it's kind of stupid. You read uh, the Mistborn series, right? Yep. Well, so, let me qualify that. I read the first trilogy, okay. and I read two of the second series. So, that's one of those things where I'm like... Like, that's... That's... Like, you can read the first trilogy, and the trilogy's good. And then you have... Like, it's still set... Like, he's expanding things and moving things beyond, and it's... It's... Have you read any of the second series? Um, that's the one that's... Oh, God, it's it's more of a steampunkish one. It's... It's... it's the first one is uh, medieval, and the second one is more Western. Okay, like, yeah. Yeah, well, I would say yeah. Weird West because it's got magic in it, but... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It has the cop and his sidekick or the whatever. Well, I don't know if it's a cop. I think it's a sheriff, but yeah, it's Wax and Wayne. Whatever. Yeah, Wax and Wayne. Oh, That's Wax and Wayne is pretty, you know, memorable. Or Yeah. I was remember. just trying to... I was like, oh, they've got to play on words for their names. And I couldn't remember what yeah. it was. But I, I, I really like. That's a that's a good example, I think, where you know you told a story. The universe is interesting. We're going to tell a completely, you know, different story. And well, he said he had plans for a timeline for that universe. Yeah. Where, you know, it was, it was medieval. Then it was going to be western, and then it's going to be something else. And yeah. That's, yeah, I mean, writing in the same world, I don't have any problem with that. I don't have any write, a problem with writing, like, uh, Mark Lawrence. He did uh, the... Something Empire. Uh, but it's Prince of Thorns, King of Thorns, Emperor of Thorns. And then he wrote another trilogy that's set in that same time, in that exact same time period, but only somewhere on the, another part of the realm uh, with totally different characters. And they actually run into each other at one point for like one scene in a bar. But I thought it was interesting that it was a parallel, just like Eden and Ender. Um, I have no problem with that. I have no problem with you taking me to a different part of the realm and telling me a different story so long as it's just as good, right? Right. And it's not a continuance of the original trilogy. I took this too far on one spot. I'm going to have to do some weight out. Damn it. Because the edge is right here. And I'm just reminding myself so I can erase later.
Yeah. So to use different characters in the same universe or use or same world, same country, same time period. Uh, Joe Abercrombie did it too. Abercrombie. He did it with uh, the first Law series where he moved around that same realm. And sometimes it was with those characters. Sometimes it was with descendants of those characters. Sometimes it was uh, different countries. Sometimes it's way far in advance of what he started with. And I was completely cool with that. So. So, the other day, I was thinking of different things that we could discuss on here, whatever. <laughs> and uh, I started thinking about just making up failed comic book concepts, like ideas we ran by each other that we were like, no, no. For, and they would just be incredibly bad like I thought of one like the Incredible Sulk where it's basically a Hulk ripoff but he's he's just really sulky <laughs> and just like all these terrible concepts or I had one it was basically it was a giant chicken in a, a white hood and, and robes and we're going to call him the Clue Kluxer. He'd be the villain. Just, I mean, just truly terrible concepts. But this is what I do instead of. Like he's a bad detective and he's called the Clue Kluxer. Sure, who knows? Or he's. <laughs> I just, uh, it's some of the, you know, when you think about some of the, some of the uh, comic book character concepts that get greenlit and then they're like, what mushroom were you eating when you thought of that? <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot of. Uh, Golden Age comics and Silver Age comics that really were made to be fun. Yeah. They weren't made to be serious. So, there's a lot of holdovers from them that these days they're trying to make more serious, but they're trying to flip to uh, something that they weren't even made to be. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, you know, like they're politicizing stuff that wasn't meant to be politicized. It was meant to be kind of goofy, you know. Uh, yeah. Like what we were talking about when uh, I think it was Chuck Dixon was saying that the difference between Marvel Comics and DC Comics was that DC Comics were made to be fun. They were made to be for kids and silly. So that's why you got Aquaman and that's why you got, you know, Hawkman and all boy. that where you really didn't expect it to be believable. And then Marvel was the Jewish guilt books, which you could see in Spider-Man and <clears throat> like most of their characters are a little bit more serious, but they're a little bit more saying that, you know, something went wrong. This is the consequence of it, and, or the guilt book, guilt stuff with Spider-Man, like he killed uh, killed Craven, and for a long time that was the only character he killed. He killed Craven, and he whined about it for like 500 issues. <laughs> like Craven was trying to kill you, dude. It's not like Spider-Man just ran out and started, you know, killing killing people like the Punisher. still one of my favorite crossovers i think jim lee illustrated it and it was the punisher spider-man crossed over and spider-man wouldn't let the punisher kill anybody and the punisher looked at spider-man and goes that's why you keep fighting the same villains <laughs> yeah yeah it just made me just crack me up i'm like yep that's exactly why you keep fighting the same villains because you don't kill any of them but that's the whole point too right with great power comes great responsibility. Guess that's kind of why I'm okay with Shepard being a little bit of an anti-hero, because I was always more of the Punisher than Spider-Man when it comes to the two. So we had like four people watching. Yeah. <laughs> we had three people watching there. And then we started talking about politics. There's three people watching? Yeah. <laughs> I'll be surprised at how many people actually stopped in to look later. I'm sure. That's how it usually works. Front face into this and focus on this. It's hard for me to stop on the black that I'm working on right now because it's going to really define this whole picture, right? Is this the part that's in shadow?
Jay said, Daredevil, there's this guy wandering around shooting criminals. He's wearing a big scary skull shirt. On a shirt. What? I'm just reading Jay's comment. I didn't hear what you said. That's why I asked you, huh? Daredevil. There's this guy wandering around shooting criminals. He's wearing a big scary skull shirt. And then Punisher. God, I miss Nob. <laughs> now, see, my problem with that is, is how does Daredevil know what he's wearing? Because of the vibrations. The vibrations and the skull shirt? The vibrations on the pink of the shirt. Yeah. The Punisher is thinking, God, I miss no. <laughs> See, that's one of those things. Like, I don't know. I think it would be way cooler. Because it, it can't be the same guy if he was a Nom. Like, not anymore. Like, there's just no way. He's too old. So, well, yeah, he'd have to be like 70 or something, 80. Right. So, like, I don't know. I mean, I just think that there's a certain part of me that just thinks it would be more interesting if you let the original character die, you know, and, and figure out ways to pass the It would be the more mantle. interesting if they actually told more st stories with the original character instead of skipping around all over the place. Well, they, and they did have him train a female. They did have him train a replacement. Yeah. So, yeah, like, I think that the, the Punisher should be a mantle. Like Robin Hood, where there was no real one Robin Hood. It was uh, a name that the thieves of Sherwood Forest or the outlaws of Sherwood Forest that were called wolf's heads, by the way, because they could be killed on sight. Um, they used that to create a boogeyman. But I think I, I always said that the Punisher and Batman should be that way, where it was a mantle that, you know, Bruce Wayne's not going to still be alive. Right. He was an adult in the 40s, so yeah, that's that's kind of hard to swallow, but yeah, or they should have to keep the character in a time frame where they yeah. belong. Like, yeah, the that's, story should... that's what I was saying about the Punisher, exactly, right there. Go ahead. I was just yeah, agreeing. I mean, you know, if uh, if you want to read about the Punisher, you know, he taps that on about, what, the 90s? Like, so, you have 20 years to play with or so, maybe. Well, uh, he came home from Nam. So, like, first of all, we don't know when he came back from Nam. Like, I don't know the, I don't know the date. I, I'd have to look at it. Uh, second of all, how old was he when he was in Nam? Because the average soldier, you know, was 19, right? Right. But there were people that joined up younger. A lot about their age. So, he, you know, there's, there's a little discrepancy, a little play, I guess. But, and then I think Rambo was a huge hit. First Blood was a huge hit, and that was what, in the 80s, right? Uh, 
I was I would guess like right eighty four. Oh, I think it's earlier than that. Well, there was a couple of them. There were a couple of them, but yeah, I mean, I'm not not trying to be exact. I'm trying to, you know, give you a. 1982. All right. So, yeah, it was two years earlier, but you could conceive of him being still in the same place in two years. And when was First Blood Part 2? I gotta look that up. When he actually went back to Vietnam in the storyline. And... That's 85. Right. And there were actually still Prisoner of War and all of that stuff. And that's the focus of the movie. So that is that is the kind of time zone, time realm. Uh, I guess... I guess you could go up to like part three, right? That would be yeah. believable, but I think that's probably the limit right there, right? Okay. Well, Stallone's probably pretty close to that age, right? Right, right. He's in his seventies, so like I'm, I'm just saying like believable time periods. I, I think that there you go, right there, you know, that. Uh, you you could play with it up till whenever he got home, which could have been oh, so I don't know. Actually, I'd have to look that up too to see when they started sending him home. But he could have got out on medical leave. We don't know. You know, we just know that when he got home. His wife and kids were caught in a crossfire, mafia crossfire. But he was going to be a priest. So. I think. There's, there's a lot of room to play right in there, you know? And they, they didn't. They just, you know, made him. They do that with all the superheroes, though. Really, they make them for all ages. And Chuck Dixon addressed that too. And he was saying that because like DC stuff was really written for kids, they expected you to outgrow it. <laughs> so they expected that the generation that's reading the next Superman isn't going to be the same generation that Superman was on the last one. I think after I get past this kneecap. Well, you made it through without any of the worries you had before the show. What was that? Oh, yeah, well. 
I don't know. So maybe I'm getting close. <laughs> uh, I'm not there. I would never know the first. So. <laughs> What's that? I mean, there are two oh. options. The less lethal of the two. Oh, yeah. I'm not there. I won't know. Yeah, I haven't caught my son's bug, if that's what you mean. <laughs> right. At least, I don't think I have. <sighs> I hope you have not. <laughs> so, you guys don't really have school Monday, or you have school online Monday, or you're going to just say screw it because nobody's really going to show up? Or It's online. <laughs> it's online. Uh -huh. It's online. It'll be online, but it's a very short schedule. It'll be done by 11.15. And some of my classes will show up more than others. <laughs> some of them actually want to be there? Some of them... I don't know. They're just more invested. Just how it works. Yeah, I thought you I thought you had a following that you showed up here. Just once in a while. Uh, their attention span is probably over. <laughs> the novelty I don't know has, if that's a good thing. <laughs> the novelty for them has, has worn off. I think pretty close to done for the night. Yeah, because it's almost morning. It's always almost morning when we stop. We rarely stop on a good time. I just want to get enough to interconnectivity to 
pretty much see where we're going to with it. Like all these crackly parts and broken parts or whatever. Uh, need to disappear into shadow, so. Kind of what I wanted to do with bringing it up to the leg so you can see, you know, where it's going. Disappearing into shadow, but I still continue if I was, you know, so one of those things where once you get into it, I'm not paying attention to the clock. I'm paying attention to what I'm getting. <clears throat> do we have a full picture? Do I need to back up the camera? Let's see if I can do this without taking it out. And there, take this shiny bit away. Can you see what's going on? Well, you have a bigger screen than I do, but oh yeah, I can see. All this is black, so I mean, we might have a little chips out of it here and there, but for the most part, it's kind of shadow. Yeah. I should have erased this line to even it up with this side and the bottom side and the top side. It's a little edge, so I can probably get it with Posca White. Okay. Jay says it's cool. Thank you. It's getting there. It's getting there. Feels like feels like a real piece of comic art for our comic book, right? It does. That's that's what I wanted. I want to get us a real piece of comic art. <laughs> Still need to finish. I mean, it's still need to finish, but obviously. But I wanted to get the pencils done, and the pencils are done. <clears throat> ah, shit. Except for one little spot, but I'll get. But I'll get that off camera. Okay. I'll never even know about it because I won't tell you. Okay. <laughs> I tell you, but you got to keep your mouth shut. You're sealed. Okay. You're sealed into the pack. Okay. All right. So yeah, it's almost four hours of screen. Yeah. Yeah. What you? What happens when you color a lot of black with a little tiny? Yeah. All right. So thank you everybody for showing up and watching. Uh, thank you for liking if you liked and subscribing if you subscribed and following if you followed. Make a comment. Let us know if you like the. the subject matter, material, experience, <laughs> or have any suggestions. Uh, good night. See you. Much love. Peace.